สวัสดีครับ Hello and welcome to Daily Wisdom: Walking the Path with the Buddha. Today we're going to be discussing misunderstandings of Gautama Buddha's teachings. This is Chapter 24 in the book Developing a Life Practice: The Path That Leads to Nibbana. Throughout this book, I have been sharing teachings with you that are helping you to understand the path to enlightenment as taught by Gautama Buddha. And one of my roles as your teacher through the book, through podcasts, through classes, through all the resources that I share, one of my roles, if not the main role as your teacher, is to help you see this path to enlightenment as clearly, concisely, and directly as possible. Kind of illuminating the path for you so that you can walk this path. Because that's what a teacher essentially does, is shares the teachings with you in a way that you can clearly see what did Gautama Buddha actually teach. Because then when you learn those teachings, you can then practice them and see the truth for yourself. So that then as the mind awakens, the mind becomes more peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy, this enlightened mental state. As these discontent feelings start to diminish and gradually become eliminated, then you know that you're learning the truth and you can make decisions to walk this path. As you know, as your teacher, I can't walk the path for you. I can't convince you to walk the path. I can't force you. I would never even try to force you. I can't impress upon you uh, the path. It's all about personal choices of the practitioner, of the students, to learn and then practice those teachings to improve the condition of the mind. And in fact, on this path to enlightenment, there is a million and one decisions, you know, three million and one decisions that you're going to need to make as you progress on this path. Not only just learning, but even just choosing to meditate every day. Each day that you wake up and you choose to meditate, each night when you choose to meditate before going to bed, those are personal choices that you are making as part of your path to enlightenment. And what the teacher's job is, in my view, my role, is to illuminate this path for you as clear as possible. And of course, I do that in multiple ways. One of the primary ways that I illuminate this path for you is I attempt to be a very deep and dedicated practitioner of these teachings. That's the number one thing. Without being a very deep and dedicated practitioner where you can see somebody practicing right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness and right concentration. If you didn't have that role model and that example, how could you ever have confidence that the person teaching you actually understands the teachings? So if I'm teaching right speech, but I'm talking with wrong speech, how could you ever have confidence to actually learn from this person and actually feel that you're progressing on this path? So it's my practice, my example, my role model that I feel is the primary way that I illuminate this path for you to enlightenment. Okay. Of course, the second way is through those experiences of practicing the teachings myself is provide you learning resources that are going to guide you on this path. And the learning resources that I provide, whether it's book, audiobook, podcast, YouTube videos, quizzes, answering your personal questions, spending private time with you in discussions, you know, retreats, uh, online classes, what have you, those are opportunities to share the teachings with you based on your request, based on you seeking guidance to learn and understand these teachings. So the second way that I illuminate this path for you is by sharing the actual true and real teachings that I know 100% are going to lead to enlightenment in your enlightenment. The more you understand them and learn them, ultimately practicing them, the more your mind is, is going to awaken to this enlightened mental state. So these are kind of the first two primary ways that I feel is my role 
to illuminate this path for you. One is being a role model and an example. The Buddha said, one who sees me sees the teachings, and one who sees the teachings sees me. Essentially, if you see him in his living flesh, he was a living, breathing, walking example of these teachings. One who sees me sees the teachings. I think this is a very important teaching for all of us to live by. One sees you, they should see the teachings. And then if you see the teachings in the world around you, then you see the Buddha. You know that he existed because the more you understand his teachings, the more you will see them all around you every day. And you'll know that this person existed. So this first one, one who sees me sees the teachings or the way that I'm sharing it is being a very good role model for you so that you can see what it looks like to practice right view all the way through to right concentration and sharing those experiences through resources that you can then learn from and apply in your life and see that it actually works. Well, the third way that I feel that is utterly important to illuminate this path to enlightenment for you is to help you understand the misunderstandings of Gautama Buddha's teachings. Because it's one thing to teach you the teachings and have you learn those and progress with those teachings and see yourself progressing. However, when you enter in various environments or various communities or whether it's here in Thailand or other parts of the world, whether it's in the Theravada tradition, the Mahayana tradition, the Vajrayana tradition, or any of the other sects that are offshoots of those traditions, you're going to see potentially various things being practiced that are most likely in conflict with what I'm sharing with you through the resources that I provide. And you might ask yourself, hmm, this is interesting. You know, David shared that there's no rites, rituals, and ceremonies in the Buddhist teachings, and they don't lead to enlightenment. But here I walked into this, Thai, this temple in Thailand, and they're performing rites, rituals, and ceremonies. You know, what gives? You know, why, why is David sharing this from the Buddhist teachings, but yet the temples are sh doing something potentially different, some of them? Well, the short answer to that question is impermanence, right? There's various communities all over the world practicing lots of different things. But what I aim to do in this chapter 24, Misunderstandings of Gautama Buddha's Teachings, and what I aim to do in this talk with you today is to share with you the misunderstandings of Gautama Buddha's Teachings, some of the primary ones, so that as you progress in your journey to enlightenment, as you progress along this path and you happen to come in contact with other practitioners or communities or temples that are maybe doing something that I haven't taught or that you don't understand, that you will understand why those things are occurring and you will understand that those things are not part of the original path that Gautama Buddha taught, the original path to enlightenment. Because one of my primary goals, not only as a teacher, but as a practitioner, is to practice and share only those teachings that were shared by Gautama Buddha. Because he was the Buddha, right? He was self-awakened. He shared those teachings of his self-awakening. Uh, countless individuals became enlightened. And then after his death, countless other people became enlightened too. The teachings have been around for 2,500 years for a reason, because he was the Buddha. And being self-awakened, he understood these natural laws of existence, these teachings that lead to enlightenment, better than anyone else that has ever walked the face of this earth. So my goal is to share those teachings with you and kind of revitalize and resync and refresh these teachings throughout the world so that more and more and more people can understand what the Buddha actually taught because it's his teachings that lead to enlightenment, not the many modifications and adaptations that happened after his death. Those things are not what leads to enlightenment. In fact, 
you know from this program and through the resources that I provide that the primary problems that the Buddha discovered is craving, anger, and ignorance. This self and the ego. All of these things need to be eliminated in order to attain enlightenment. Craving, anger, and ignorance, or unknowing of true reality. The self, being selfish and self-identity, self-image, and the ego, this arrogance, this conceit. Well, when the Buddha died, the entire world wasn't enlightened. In fact, all of his students weren't enlightened. There were people at various stages of the path upon his death. So the, there were plenty of people that did attain enlightenment during his lifetime, but there were many, 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 many more people that were at various stages of the path. So they might have had some degree of awakening, but the mind may still have had, some still had craving, some still had anger, some still had ignorance or unknowing of true reality, some still had this self, this selfish desire. Some still had ego and arrogance. And my thought is, is that as he died, there were a core group of people who got together, who were enlightened and truly understood the teachings and had gotten rid of ego and gotten rid of the self and truly understand what it took to get to enlightenment. And they band together and really made sure they put the teachings down in a very clear and concise way so that they could be shared for many generations afterwards, including you and I. But what has happened over the last 2,500 years is as time has gone on, because of impermanence and because of those original problems the Buddha discovered, craving, anger, ignorance, the unknowing of true reality, the self and the ego, more and more people decided to change the teachings, right? So they might have gotten some level of awakening with Gautama Buddha's teachings, but then at some point in time, the ego was still in place and they felt, you know what? The Buddha got this wrong. There isn't five realms of existence, there's six. Or the Buddha got this wrong. There isn't five realms of existence. There's eight or there's 32, right? You're going to see all these different numbers that people say number of realms of existence. Or people will say, you know, the Buddha got it wrong. You know, these precepts aren't like this. They're like that. Or this eightfold path, it isn't like that. It's like this. Well, who are they to change the teachings of the Buddha, the self-awakened one, right? That, that is the first being who brought these teachings to the earth and shared it with countless individuals. If the ego is still there and there's still this ignorance or unknowing of true reality, there's still this self, there's still this craving, then sure, these 30 monks go off and start creating their own brand of Buddhism right? Or these 20 or 30, 40, 50 people with householders go off and decide to create their brand of Buddhist teachings. And in my view, that's what's essentially happened here on earth is from the death of the Buddha, there's been massive amount of impermanence that have essentially made his teachings invisible to the average person. His teachings have become essentially invisible where it's very difficult to see this path. This path is not quite illuminated the way it was during his actual life when he was laying down the real teachings. So as people progressed, as time progressed, impermanence drastically affected the teachings and those same original problems, craving, anger, ignorance, the self and the ego, started to get more and more rooted within even the monks that were practicing, the bhikkhus, the bikinis, the lay people. Because the Buddha dying, this eradication of craving, anger, ignorance, the self and the ego became less and less and less because his teaching slowly deteriorated over time. In fact, the Buddha actually predicted this. When he was alive, he gave five 500-year cycles where he said in the first 500 years, 
people would really understand his teachings very deeply and there would continue to be lots and lots of people who would continue to get enlightened through the teachings. And then he gave these other 500 year cycles where essentially the teachings become less and less visible, less and less understood, and then essentially the teachings become invisible. The last 500 years, he said that the monks, lay people, and other people would be fighting and arguing over what are his real true teachings. And we just ended that 500 year cycle about two years ago, okay, two, two to three years ago. We ended that last 500 year cycle. And what you're seeing throughout the Buddhist world, throughout the Buddhist community, and you can definitely see this if you're involved in any of the Facebook groups that are about Buddhism, is you see this massive amount of misunderstanding about the Buddhist teachings and you just see this arguing and bickering and disagreement about what did the Buddha actually teach and what is this path to enlightenment. And what I'm choosing to do through the resources that I provide is make this path as clear and as illuminated as possible for anybody who chooses to learn and practice the teachings. And today what we're going to do is we're going to go through and we're going to talk about these three different traditions that have spawned since the Buddha's death. And we're going to go through nine different misunderstandings and things to consider that if you see these things or if you're aware of these things to understand and consider that these are in fact misunderstandings of Gautama Buddha's teachings. So that's our plan for today. And I've got some slides to help me because this is really helpful to share some pictures with you and some text with you. So I'm going to share that with you now to help you start understanding what it is that I'm going to be sharing with you. This first one that I'm sharing with you is all about the three primary branches of Buddhist teachings. The first one, the first branch, is called the Theravada Buddhism. Okay, it used to be called Hinayana Buddhism but now it's called Theravada Buddhism. This is a tradition of Buddhist teachings that are primarily hosted in South and Southeast Asia. South Asia is kind of like India, you know, Pakistan, Afghanistan a little bit, over to like Bhutan and Bangladesh. Uh, and then Southeast Asia, of course, is coming down to Burma, Laos, Myanmar, Cambodia, South Vietnam. These are kind of like the primary areas that are hosting these teachings of Theravada Buddhism. Some people used to refer to this as Hinayana Buddhism or the lesser vehicle. Today, we don't use that. You still might find a few people who do use that, but it's considered to be a degrading term and not something that should be used. Theravada means teachings of the elders. Okay, in this tradition of Buddhist teachings, the thought or the feeling is, is that the practitioners and teachers in this tradition of Buddhism would like to keep the teachings as close to the form of the teachings that Gautama Buddha taught during his lifetime, leading up to his death. We're not interested in changing or adapting or modifying or mixing or any of these things. We feel like the Buddha was the Buddha. He laid down the teachings. Those teachings are captured in the Pali Canon, which is the original source of his teachings, and those are the teachings that lead to enlightenment. Any modifications or changes that have come after his death, we don't recognize those as the teachings that would lead to enlightenment because they weren't shared by the Buddha. The Buddha shared what needed to be atta to attain enlightenment. So the Theravada tradition or Theravada Buddhism is all about maintaining the purity as close to the Buddhist teachings as possible. And you'll see this primarily practiced in South and Southeast Asia. But even within this tradition, there has certainly been some changes and adaptations and misunderstandings, which is primarily what we're going to be talking about today. 
are the misunderstandings within the Theravada tradition. Because the teachings that I share in the, in the mindset that I have approaching practice and teaching is to retain the teachings as close to what the Buddha actually taught during his lifetime as possible. I'm not interested in all the other changes. It's interesting from a research or scholarly perspective, but in terms of practice and teaching, I'm not interested in it because it's not what the Buddha actually taught. So within this Theravada tradition, there's some misunderstandings as well within this tradition. So a lot of those I've actually already taught as part of this book and part of this group learning program. I never called them out as misunderstandings, but I just taught you what is the real true teachings. But here in this chapter, I'm kind of calling out some specific things to help you see very clearly if you enter into a Theravada community or some of these other communities, what is and is not a teaching of Gautama Buddhas. So this first tradition, Theravada Buddhism, is where I source the teachings and all the resources that I share with you. And I know that these teachings lead to enlightenment. The second tradition is called Mahayana Buddhism. And I know very little about Mahayana and Vajrayana Buddhism. I've never actually sat down with a teacher of Mahayana or Vajrayana Buddhism because I haven't felt the need to. In the Theravada tradition, it explains everything exactly the way that I observe it in the world. What I see in the world, the natural laws of existence, what I've learned, through the Pali Canon of the teachings of Gautama Buddha, I can take those teachings, I can apply them in life, and I can see that they are the truth. I can independently observe what the Buddha taught during his lifetime is actually the truth. And I can see, improve, and observe that those teachings are the truth. That becomes wisdom, and the mind changes, and I've seen the changes in the mind, and I've seen changes in my life. So I've never had a need to actually go learn Mahayana Buddhism or Vajrayana Buddhism. It just isn't something that I've actually found needed. However, I have become somewhat familiar to a small degree of these various teachings just in kind of like casual conversations here and there. Mahayana Buddhism comes out about 300 to 1,000 years after the Buddha's death. This kind of spawns a new tradition and takes on its own life. And this tradition is primarily hosted in East Asia, kind of like China. And people refer to this sometimes as what they call the greater vehicle, okay? I'm not gonna go into all the differences between Mahayana and Theravada Buddhism because I don't think that that's helpful and I think that it can kind of be confusing and because I haven't actually spent an enormous amount of time studying the Mahayana Buddhist tradition, I don't think I'm the appropriate person to actually give a direct comparison between the two traditions. But there are things that we're going to talk about today that come from the Mahayana tradition that I know are not the teachings of Gautama Buddha. And uh, I will share that with you and then you can investigate it and decide for yourself but I've never had the need to actually sit down and actually learn this branch of Buddhism because the Theravada traditions explain everything and lead to the results that Gautama Buddha discussed. When Gautama Buddha discussed in the Pali Canon what enlightenment is, what it, the experience is, you know, what to be expected, I have observed that those things are in fact the truth. So it's the Theravada tradition that I feel really shares Gautama Buddha's teachings in a way that can be learned and practiced to then attain the results of, the, of enlightenment. But again, there's even some modifications in there that we're going to talk about today. Then there's this third branch of Buddhism called Vajrayana Buddhism. This is primarily hosted in Tibet, Bhutan, Mongolia, and the Russian Republic of Kalmykia. Okay, this is where the Vajrayana tradition uh, uh, is primarily hosted. This tradition comes about a thousand years after Gautama Buddha's death. And of course, a scholar or researcher or academic would have much more details on when these traditions started and 
uh, spread and how they spread. I'm just kind of giving you a general overview right now. But about a thousand years after Gautama Buddha's death is when the Vajrayana tradition starts to spawn. And it takes on a very different approach than what we do in the Vajrayana tradition. Uh, I'm sorry, what we do in the Theravada tradition. In the Vajrayana tradition, there's much more emphasis on ceremonies, rites, rituals, worship, things like this, where the Theravada tradition, what the Buddha taught, was those things don't lead to enlightenment. If you're familiar with the Dalai Lama, he's from the Vajrayana tradition. Sometimes if people are moving from a Christian background or Catholic background, they may look at the Dalai Lama as kind of the equivalent of the Pope to Christianity as the Dalai Lama is to Buddhism. But this actually isn't true. There is no person within the Buddhist tradition that has kind of a role as the Pope because there's no centralized organization that is responsible for collecting and disseminating the teachings. These teachings truly live in the hearts and the minds of individual practitioners in various communities around the world. So the Dalai Lama is essentially just another monk. That's really what he is, is he's just another monk. He happens to be a well-known monk and somebody who is in the news and has a lot of visibility across the world, but he's just another monk. He's on the path just like you and I, and based on his own words that he talked about recently, he's actually not yet enlightened. So the teachings of the Vajrayana tradition are very, very different than Theravada and very different than Mahayana. All of these are all very different. And in the Vajrayana tradition, they call this the lightning fast vehicle. Now, what people are referencing here when they say lesser vehicle, great vehicle, or lightning fast vehicle, what they're referencing is the speed or quickness at which you can attain enlightenment. Well, if you've learned anything from me in the last six months, you know that there's no such thing as a, as a quick fix. There's no such thing as hurrying up to enlightenment, right? So if anyone's referring to Theravada as lesser vehicle, Mayana is greater vehicle, and Vajrayana is lightning fast vehicle, then they're misunderstanding the whole approach to attaining enlightenment because the Buddha himself described enlightenment as a gradual progression of training the mind, learning the teachings, training the mind, and progressing to this enlightened mental state. So if there's anyone that's trying to hurry up to get to enlightenment, they're kind of missing the whole point. It's about being patient and you know, gradually learning and working through these teachings. Well, because most of us are from the West and or you know you speak English so you're familiar with the West, the vast majority of what's kind of spread into the West up to this point is the Vajrayana and Mahayana tradition. Because if there's anything that we know about the Western world and the modern world is everybody wants it fast, right? Everybody wants everything fast. So when the teaching started spreading, it was the Mahayana and Vajrayana traditions that really spread to the West first because everybody was kind of bought into this lightning fast aspect of attaining enlightenment or this greater vehicle. Well, what I see here in Thailand is I actually see practitioners and even monks and teachers from the Mahayana and Vajrayana traditions come here to Thailand because they might have attained some level of awakening in their tradition, but they know themselves they're not yet fully awake. So they will oftentimes come here and spend time with the enlightened masters in Thailand in order to get that extra teaching that they need to kind of blend the Vajrayana traditions with what they already, I'm sorry, they need to blend the Theravada traditions with what they already know in the Mahayana or Vajrayana tradition. So they're reaching outside of their tradition in order to bring something else from the Theravada tradition in order to help them get more awake. Okay, so my approach to practice and teaching is not to mix. I don't suggest anybody mix any teachings of any tradition. Because when we start mixing these traditions, what ends up happening is we dilute the effectiveness and the potency of each individual tradition. 
So if we maintain the purity of the, Vaj of the Theravada tradition, then there's more potent teachings that really, really work and the path is more clearly illuminated for everyone. Where if in the Mahayana tradition, if people are mixing, then they're kind of diluting what's there. And conversely, if the Mahayana tradition is the truth, there would be no reason to mix. Or if the Vajrayana tradition is the truth and leads to full awakening, then there would be no reason to mix it with something else. So in the Theravada tradition, the people who are here, we know and we understand that this is the truth because the teachings lead exactly where the Buddha said to complete elimination of discontentedness. The mind completely eliminates all anger, frustration, irritation, annoyance, guilt, shame, fears, boredom, loneliness, shyness, uh, resentment, jealousy. We know with 100% certainty that these teachings are the truth because they lead exactly where Gautama Buddha said they do. But we don't have a desire or a craving or attachment to push all of these teachings and force the whole world to practice these teachings. When you know the truth, you only need to walk with wisdom and a smile. You don't need to push these teachings onto anybody else. So we make them available to people to come here and learn and understand and experience the same results, but we're not trying to forcibly push the teachings into the world. And in the Theravada tradition, we don't have any interest to mix Mahayana tradition into the Theravada teachings. And we don't have any need or interest to mix the Vajrayana traditions into the Theravada tradition because the Theravada tradition stands on its own merits. It stands on its own merits. It by itself, with all the teachings and all the practitioners and all the teachers within the Theravada tradition, it is producing enlightened beings. And we know that. So we don't need to go outside of this tradition in order to bring in something that the Theravada tradition doesn't have because from my perspective, it already has everything that it needs. So if somebody is in the Mahayana tradition and they're reaching outside to bring something in that it doesn't have, then that goes to show that there isn't enough substantial and potent teachings within the Mahayana tradition to sustain creating enlightened beings within that tradition. And likewise for Vajrayana, if Vajrayana practitioners are needing to reach outside of their tradition to bring in teachings from outside, it means that it doesn't stand on its own merits and it's missing something, okay? So my approach, what I suggest to everybody is to pick a tradition and stick with it. Don't muddle it, don't mix it, don't dilute it by going outside of the tradition. You can actually attain enlightenment in the Theravada tradition, which I know for sure. You may be able to attain enlightenment in Mahayana tradition. I don't know because I didn't follow that path. You may be able to attain Vaj enlightenment in the Vajrayana tradition. I don't know because I didn't learn that path. and. I'm not really educated to talk about either one of those approaches, but I do know that this enlightened mental state is a human phenomenon. It's a human phenomenon that is available to all humans. And I've met people even in the Christian tradition that I would consider to be enlightened. They would say they've attained the Holy Spirit, but I would say you're enlightened based on my understanding of these teachings. So in my view, this human phenomenon that we call enlightenment or nibbana or liberation of the mind, there's actually multiple paths. And there's even modern day paths nowadays called like quantum physics, right? These various teachers, whether it's Gautama Buddha, Jesus Christ, Prophet Muhammad, and some other teachers, they're all kind of tapping into these natural laws of existence and describing it in their own way. Gautama Buddha described it in his way based on his own cultural understanding, his language, his cultural context. Jesus Christ explained it in his understanding. You know, other teachers explained it in their understanding. 
to me, Gautama Buddha got it the most right, the most clear. It's the most profound. He was the perfectly fully enlightened Buddha. Nobody else helped him on that path. These other teachers are not a fully enlightened Buddha, and therefore I feel like the path isn't quite as clear. So if we're going to maintain this illuminated path to enlightenment, we need to ensure that we're not mixing teachings from other traditions and that we learn very clearly what is the Theravada tradition, which is what I've been explaining in this whole program all the way throughout. And we also need to know inside of our own tradition, what are some of the misunderstandings so that we can more clearly see this path and illuminate this path, right? So let me stop here and see if there's any questions on anything we've discussed so far. Hi, David. We have no questions this time. Okay. Now, this map that I'm showing here on the screen, it shows the focal point as being where the Buddha was actually from. He was born in modern-day Nepal and spent time there and kind of in northeast India. And then the various branches of Buddhism kind of spread from there. And they didn't necessarily spread exactly the way it shows on this map, okay? If you talk with an academic, a researcher, or a scholar, they will have a much more accurate representation of how the teachings actually spread throughout the world. They didn't all come from that same focal point and spread throughout the world as neatly and cleanly as this map shows, okay? Because the teachings that are here in Thailand, there's quite a bit of evidence that the teachings came from that Nepal, northeastern India area, spread down to Sri Lanka, and then it was from Sri Lanka that the teachings came over into Thailand, from Sri Lanka. But this map makes it appear that they come from the same region where the Buddha was and then spread out through Thailand from there. So this map is by no means meant to be an accurate representation of exactly how the teaching spread throughout the world. Academic scholars, researchers spend an enormous amount of time looking at that. And they would be the people that would actually be able to share that with you much more closely, as well as the dates on this map. I don't know that these dates are necessarily accurate. I know that the Buddha died in 483 BC, but at what point these various traditions spread and so forth, the time frame. If you were interested in that kind of thing, you could certainly get it from an academic researcher or scholar. For me, I've spent time with some of those people and got a little bit of information from them, but I'm more interested in what are the teachings and how do you practice them to attain enlightenment and then sharing those with other people. The time frame of what happened in the past and how it moved from place to place, it's interesting. It's, it's an interesting discussion and I spent some time learning about that. But in terms of what's gonna lead to your enlightenment, knowing what happened in the past isn't really as important as what do I do right now in this moment to learn and practice the teachings. So to me, that's what's most important is making sure we learn and practice the teachings right now in this moment. So I've got this map on here just to make the slide a little bit more colorful, honestly. <laughs> um, but don't take it as uh, an authentic or authoritative source of exactly how Buddhism spread throughout the world. Uh, but one thing that you will notice is from that region of where Gautama Buddha started in Nepal and Northeast India, from that area into India, down to Sri Lanka and over into Southeast Asia, that is the Theravada tradition. So the closer you get to the source of where Gautama Buddha actually originated from, people are practicing the Theravada tradition. As you get farther away to places like East Asia, i.e. China, you get further away from the source of where Gautama Buddha originated and you get further away from the teachings that he actually shared. So this is why Mahayana tradition is based over in East Asia and you get further away. But here in this kind of closer, more um, nucleus, this womb where the Buddha actually originated from, this is where you get more of the Theravada tradition, okay? 
So now let's move on to the next part that I was planning to discuss, which are the actual misunderstandings of things that you'll actually see in the Theravada tradition. And later we'll talk about some other things from some of the other traditions. This first thing that I would like to talk with you about is something called Guatnam. That's what we call it in Thai. We call it Guatnam or pouring water ceremony. This is actually done in many places throughout Theravada community. And this is an enormous misunderstanding of Gautama Buddha's teachings. The thought here is, is after you come together for a particular event where the monks have been chanting and uh, there's been a Dhamma talk or something else, there's been offerings made from the household community to the bhikkhus or bikinis. At the towards the end of that event or ceremony, um, there's a period where all the people gather these little urns in this little bowl, and they will pour and slowly pour the water from this urn into this bowl as the monks are chanting. And they slowly pour this water out into the bowl, and then they go outside and they pour the water on a tree. Okay, what the people believe, okay, they believe, okay, it's not truth. What they believe is that by pouring this water into this little bowl, any merit, any good, wholesome gamma that they've created, they can transfer it from themselves to their dead relatives. Okay. This is not possible based on the Buddhist teachings and based on everything we know. So this Guatnam pouring this water somehow miraculously, all that good wholesome merit that somebody's created is actually going to be transferred to their dead relatives. And then they believe that if they take this water and pour it on a tree, that then the water goes up into the tree and then out through the leaves, it evaporates and goes up to heaven to the angels and it helps their dead relatives. Okay, so this is what you might hear people talk about. But this is all belief, because if you remember back to the chapter where we talked about merit, what merit is, is it's wholesome karma when a person offers goods or supplies or effort or energy or financial support to the teachers that are sharing the teachings of the Buddha and providing those offerings are helping to spread and share the teachings of the Buddha, support the teachings of the Buddha, but it's also helping you. The reason why it's helping you when you create merit is because it's teaching and training the mind to let go and not have craving, not hold on. Because remember the primary problem, craving, anger, ignorance, unknowing of true reality, that self and the ego. So by creating merit in this life, by making offerings, what you're doing is you're practicing generosity, which is one of the antidotes that the Buddha taught to eliminate craving is by practicing generosity. So by you practicing generosity and making offerings, it's helping you. It's helping you eliminate craving helping you to eliminate this discontent mind, right? Furthermore, when the Buddha talked about gamma, he said, you are the owner, the heir, the inheritor of your own gamma. He said, you can't transfer it, basically, is what he said. He said, you are the owner, the heir, the inheritor of your own gamma. Anything you do, good or bad, you are its heirs. That's what he said. He said, anything you do, good or bad, it comes to you. It doesn't go to anyone else. So for example, if I go out and steal a car and I bring it home and then the police come by and see this stolen car in front of my house, they're going to come to me. They're eventually going to find me. I'm going to jail. Not my wife, not my son. They didn't steal the car. They're not getting the bad karma. They're not getting the unwholesome karma. I'm getting it. I'm going to jail, not them. I can't transfer that to them, right? Likewise, if I do something good, 
if I go outside and I make an offering or I'm helping homeless people or I'm helping people in my community, that's helping to train my mind to eliminate craving. I can't transfer that to my wife. If she's got craving in her practice, she has to practice the teachings in order for her to get the benefits. That's her gamma to learn and practice the teachings. I can't transfer that good, wholesome gamma to her. It's not possible by just pouring this water and then putting it under a tree and expecting it to go up. Or for example, my mom is dead. My mom's dead. And who knows if she was reborn or not, or whether she attained enlightenment at death. Um, she certainly wasn't enlightened during her lifetime, but she may have attained it at death. But if she's now somewhere else in the world as a reborn being or as a new, new existence, I can't give things to the temple or give things to teachers to reduce my craving and then pour a little bit of water and then that's going to benefit my mom in whatever new existence she's in. She's got to learn and practice the teachings for herself in order for her to get the benefit. She makes her own decisions. It's her gamma. Okay, so this particular aspect of practice within the Theravada tradition, and I don't know if they do this in other traditions or not, but within this tradition, it's a complete misunderstanding of Gautama Buddha's teachings, but you're going to see it in a lot of places, and they believe that this is the case. This most likely came from some kind of Brahmin or Hindu practice it may have come from some of the animism or spiritual tradition or, or uh, animistic practices that the thais were practicing at one time but it probably originated not in thailand because i think there's other places like sri lanka and back in india where they actually practice this as well so this probably came to thailand with buddhism and there's some practitioners here that think this is actually a teaching of the buddha but it's actually not because one of his primary teachings, even to get to the first stage of enlightenment, is you have to eliminate what he called wrong behaviors and wrong observances. Wrong behaviors and wrong observances relates to practicing rites, rituals, and ceremonies. One of the things that he observed during his lifetime is how Brahmin at that time were practicing all these rites, rituals, ceremonies, and worship but it wasn't helping the people. And because they weren't helping the people, when the Buddha stepped in and started teaching and people were actually getting help, he explained to get to even the first stage of enlightenment, someone has to eliminate these rites, rituals, and ceremonies and not thinking that those things lead to enlightenment. Because if we think that we're literally pouring this water and transferring our gamma to another person, then that's wrong view, right? So this is another way that you can tell that this is not correct. Because what right view is, is right view is taking responsibility for your own actions through the Four Noble Truths. So if somebody thinks that they're transferring their merit to somebody else, then the tendency is, you know what? I'm not gonna do so well in this life. I'm just gonna do good enough and then when I die, my relatives will transfer merit to me and somehow that's going to be beneficial for me. Well, this is wrong view. This is completely wrong view. So on so many levels, so many different levels, the more you understand the teachings of the Buddha, you will understand that this pouring water ceremony in Guatnam is a complete misunderstanding of Gautama Buddha's teachings. But with that said, not everyone in the world understands that. So there's still plenty of people in the world who practice this. And when I see them do that, I don't judge them. I don't look down on them. I don't think they're bad people. I just know that they're not fully aware of the Buddhist teachings. And if they ask me, you know, why aren't you doing this? Then I will explain it to them why. Or if they ask me, you know, do you suggest that we do this? I would say, well, it's not part of the Buddhist teachings. And here's why. And I gave you guys multiple reasons why this is not true. It's a belief, but it's not truth. Okay. But even though not the whole world doesn't understand this, there's no reason for us to judge other people for doing it 
But if somebody asks why you don't do this, you can explain to them why based on what I shared today. Are there any questions on this one? We have some questions related to other topics. Okay, so why don't we hold those until we get to the end because I would like to make sure that we cover all of these before we actually take questions about other stuff. Okay. That way we can just stay focused on the misunderstandings. So if it's a question, Max, related to what we've been talking about so far, let's talk about those. But if it's like about meditation or other stuff, let's hold those for the end. We have one from Deborah, which is related to uh, misunderstandings, although it wasn't something you mentioned specifically, but I think it's relevant. She says, I've heard of prayers being said to assist the dying in rebirth. Is this true? And what traditions do this? This is not part of Gautama Buddha's teachings at all. If somebody dies, whatever their gamma is, that's what they'll be reborn. It's based on their own decisions. There's nothing we can do to affect somebody else's rebirth. Uh, if they have craving, they will be reborn. And based on their gamma, they will be, re be, be reborn appropriately based on that. So there's nothing we can do through prayer or ceremony or anything to affect somebody else's rebirth. It's not possible. There are other people who teach this, and it's not part of Gautama Buddha's teachings. You may see this in Mahayana tradition, Vajrayana tradition. You may even see it in Theravada tradition because there's certain practitioners that have a wrong view as well, but it's not what Gautama Buddha taught. Thanks, David. I suggest we leave the other couple of questions to the next break. Okay, sounds good. I'm going to pause at the end of each one of these so that any questions you guys have on each one we can discuss. So the next one is called the blessed water or namon. In Thai, we call namon. Nam is water. Okay. So namon is where a bhikkhu will light a candle and they'll drip the wax of the candle into a bowl of water. And as they're dripping this wax, they will be chanting. And oftentimes there's a string that connects this bowl of water all the way around to all the people that are participating in this ceremony. OK, and then after they're done, they're chanting and making this water with the dripped wax. They'll then take this kind of like it's almost like the end of a broom, but it's not. It's kind of like it's like the, the material of a broom, but it's not a broom. And they'll dip it in this water and then they'll throw this water out across all the people. And what people believe is that now this water has been transformed by this chanting, by this dripping of the wax and this water landing on you is somehow going to produce benefit. OK, once again, this is wrong view, because first of all, the Buddha never talked about blessing anything because the definition of blessing is essentially like protection from God you know, asking God for protection. So the Buddha never blessed anything, even though some people will translate and they'll call the Buddha the blessed one, right? That's not what the Buddha called himself. He never referred to himself as the blessed one. He used the word Tathagata. He may have called himself the enlightened one, right? So this word blessing doesn't fit with what Gautama Buddha actually taught. And any kind of ceremony to actually spread water and shake water over top of people is not what the Buddha taught. And there's actually a teaching specifically in Gautama Buddha's teachings where he calls this out because this must have been something that was going on during his lifetime and he had an inclination that it might continue. He actually calls this out in his teachings and he says, that he prohibits bhikkhus from creating blessed water or water that has been you know, created like this and, and spreading it. He, he says that he doesn't do that and he doesn't advise the ordained practitioners to do it either. It's right in his teachings. But the challenge is, is that even these ordained practitioners and 
definitely most of the household practitioners, even in a community like this, where 95% are Buddhist practitioners, they don't have access. They don't take the time to go get access to Gautama Buddha's teachings and learn them and practice them. So even though it's right there in the teachings, as bold and bright for everybody to see that would like to see it, there's a certain amount of complacency where people don't take the time to actually go look and learn the truth for themselves. And this is where a Buddha is very different than other practitioners. A Buddha is not going to believe anyone. They're going to go out and do the work for themselves, where teacher after teacher after teacher handing this stuff down and then household practitioners just following along as followers. If people are just following, then these kind of things can easily be spread throughout a community because people just start believing it. They don't go look for themselves and actually think for a minute. Okay, there's this bowl of water and that person, that human being who's just like me, lit a candle, they dripped wax into this water, they did a little bit of chanting, and now they're going to spread the water on us. How is that changing anything? How did that water change? How does it have any effect at changing the condition of the mind? Because the mind's got craving, anger, ignorance, or unknowing a true reality. It's got the self and the ego. How does spreading that water get rid of the ego? The answer is it doesn't. How does that water landing on me eliminate craving? It doesn't. How does it eliminate my anger? It doesn't. How does it eliminate my ignorance? It doesn't. How does it get rid of the self? It doesn't. That's the whole problem. And that's why the Buddha said he doesn't do it. Because the Buddha is only going to do things that are clearly on this path, that illuminate this path for everybody to walk. He's not going to do things that are promoting wrong view. So if people think they can go out in the world and do all these bad things, and then you just get a little bit of water sprinkled on you, and that's gone, well, that's wrong view. That's not how you change the condition of the mind. So this whole practice of namon or blessed water, it's not what the Buddha taught. He explicitly describes it in his teachings that people should not do this because it's not part of the teachings. It's not part of the path to enlightenment. But because of impermanence and 2,500 years of people just believing and passing down and passing down and passing down, it's been spread throughout the community. And again, I don't know if they do this in Mahayana or Vajrayana tradition, but they certainly do it in the Theravada tradition at some temples. And where you see that going on, it's just not the teachings of the Buddha. Again, no judgment, no arrogance, still have loving kindness and compassion for these people. They just don't know. It's part of that third poison, the ignorance or unknowing of true reality. It's part of that. And they just still have some of that in their mind. And that's why they're practicing this. And if you see somebody practicing this, you know they're not enlightened because they're not they haven't eliminated that second fetter that Gautama Buddha talked about, wrong observances and wrong behaviors, which includes eliminating rites, rituals, and ceremonies. So if somebody's doing this, then you know that this person isn't yet even enlightened because they're spreading this water. They're promoting wrong view, right, to their people who are learning with them. By spreading that water out to household practitioners, these monks or these beaconies, if they do it, are promoting wrong view, which is leading their community off the path. They're not illuminating this path very clearly for their community, and it's actually hurting and harming these people because they think that this is actually real, but it's not. So if you go to places that really, 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 truly understand the teachings, they won't be using the Guatnam or the Namon. And they, may not, they won't even be doing this third one either, which in Thai we call Sai Sin. Okay? Zen is like a pathway or a cord or a string. What this sacred thread or Sai Sin is, is 
what people believe is when you go to see ordained practitioners and what they will typically do is they'll have an event, they'll have you pour this water for the guatnam, they will sprinkle the namon on the people, and then one by one, the people will go up and get this thread, this sacred thread around the wrist. And they feel that somehow this sacred thread holds some kind of special power, special meaning, and it is going to produce beneficial things for them if they leave it on their wrist. Some people you'll see will have many, many, many of these on their body. And some people don't take them off. They feel like it's bad luck if you take it off. So they will just let it degrade and over time it will fall off by itself. Okay. Once again, this is not what the Buddha actually taught. Getting this thread from an ordained practitioner is no different than getting a piece of thread at Walmart or getting a piece of thread at some other store. This thread, while it could potentially be beneficial in terms of every time you look at it for the next week, it might remind you of the teachings that you learned. It might remind you of impermanence as it gets dirtier and dirtier when you wear it. But in terms of real change in the mind, walking up to an ordained practitioner and holding out your wrist and having them tie a piece of string on your wrist, did that eliminate craving, anger, ignorance, the self or the ego? Absolutely not. Nothing has changed from before I had the string and after I have the string, nothing changed. It's just a string on the wrist just like putting on a shirt. It's just a string. So this is a complete misunderstanding of Gautama Buddha's teachings, but you will see this being done throughout many places within the Theravada tradition. One reason why ordained practitioners do this is they do it as like a gift to the household practitioners and kind of thanking them for coming to the event, which is kind of a nice generosity and a nice little thing that they do However, in doing that, they're promoting wrong view. For me, if students or people come to learn with me in a temple environment or any kind of environment, I feel the teachings, the time, effort, and energy that I'm spending to actually share the teachings is my generosity giving to the people. And those teachings should be so helpful and so potent and so effective at helping those people improve the quality of their life and the quality of their mind, that's the gift. That's the, that's the appreciation. That's what I'm giving to the actual people. I don't need to give them a string because I've already put forth so much energy, time, and effort to share these teachings that when they learn the teachings and they go off and they improve their life with those teachings, that's enough. That's enough right there. And of course, when people come to like the temple or something, they may offer money or support or donations or whatever. So they're giving me that to help me in my life, but I'm giving them teachings. And to me, that's enough of an exchange right there. I don't feel any need to give up a, a little string because I already know that I've put so much time, effort and energy into the teachings that that's the real benefit that I'm giving to the students who choose to learn with me. I don't have an interest or desire to give them anything else. So that's the way that if ordained practitioners really want to give something to the community that they serve, they should spend a lot of time, effort, and energy to learn and practice the teachings. Then what they're giving to their community is teachings that change their life, teachings that improve the quality of their mind. There's no need to give them a string because they've already given them so much through their own practice and development and through sharing those teachings, that takes a lot of work to do that. So that's what we should be giving to the community at large is the actual teachings, not a string. Okay, so let me pause here to, to accept questions. And as I do, I wanna share this one other piece of information. The reason why I know about all of these things 
is because I participated in all of these things. This is why I don't judge people. I don't speak with arrogance. I don't look down on people who practice these things because I did these same things and I did them for a really long time. And at one time, I even taught students a long, 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 long time ago. I taught people this stuff when I was in America very early in my teaching days. But then I learned that these things don't lead to enlightenment. And when I observed that for myself, that's when I completely changed everything and I stopped teaching this. And that was between like 2005 and 2015. And I participated in this and I shared this. So I'm in no place to judge or speak with arrogance or ego about this stuff. If I learn that these things aren't the truth and they're misunderstandings, the people who are practicing them now, if they're not attached, if they're not craving and desiring to hold on to these practices, they should be able to eliminate it from their mind. They should be able to let it go because as they learn that these are not Gautama Buddha's teachings, they should be able to see, let it go because it's not promoting right view and it's not helping the community to attain enlightenment. Again, we don't judge, we don't speak with arrogance, we don't look down on people, but we realize that these things don't lead to enlightenment, so there's no sense or no reason to actually continue to share them. So let me pause here and see what questions you guys might have so far. We have a question from Biplop. He says, I have heard that the Buddha did rites or rituals after his father's death. Is it true? Not at all. Not at all. Gautama Buddha was a fully perfectly enlightened Buddha. In part of his teachings, he describes not doing rites, rituals, and ceremonies that they don't lead to enlightenment. What the Buddha used to do when people die is he used to teach the Dhamma. He would be invited to funerals and he would actually teach at the funeral because there's no ceremony that's going to improve the sadness the loneliness or the anger of the people at the funeral. When someone dies, this is a time where people become very sad because of their attachment, because of their craving and desire. The mind's holding on. People were very sad. People are very angry sometimes, very um, discontent, right? So what the Buddha would do is he would go to funerals and actually teach the Dhamma. He would teach the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path because that's the answer for how to help those people. The guy who's dead and gone or the girl, they're dead and gone. You can't do anything to fix that. That's already done and gone. The only thing that he can do as a teacher of these teachings is help the people that are right there in front of him by sharing the true teachings. So he used to actually teach the Dhamma at funerals. So just like I'm doing a Dhamma talk now, he would come in and actually teach the Dhamma at funerals. We have a question from Uma. David, sir, is there any mention about Maha Amavasya, New Moon Day, or Purnima, Full Moon Day, in the Theravada tradition? Some traditions carry out prayers for the deceased during New Moon Day. So any prayers, any ceremonies, any rites, rituals, none of that has anything to do with Gautama Buddha. People may be practicing it and calling it Buddhism, but that's not what the Buddha taught. Any of these holidays that we have now, like new moon days and things like this, these all came after the Buddha's death. Because when he was alive, he just taught. It wasn't until he died that people started kind of identifying holidays, right? The date of his birth, the date of his enlightenment, the date of his first speech or his first discourse, the date of his death. People started celebrating these things after he died, right? So all of these things that are, have come about and that we experience in modern day, they all came after his death. So anytime you see prayer or worship or rites or rituals or ceremonies has nothing to do with enlightenment, right? They do that stuff here too in Thailand, you know, like walking around different things and wrapping up different things. Now it can promote if you're walking around peacefully, you can be walking around doing walking meditation, 
or you can be building concentration, all of these things that are part of the path, you can certainly bring that into it, but there's no benefit in terms of your attainment of enlightenment that you're going to get through a prayer because who and what are you asking for and who's going to grant that because remember the problem is your consciousness your mind your mind has craving anger and ignorance or unknowing of true reality there's a self and there's an ego you're not going to pray that away right? That's got to be eliminated in order to attain enlightenment. You can't pray that away. You can't worship that away. You can't use rites and rituals to get rid of that stuff. The only thing that works is training the mind through practicing the teachings. And you have to learn them and then practice them. So anytime you see rites, rituals, ceremonies, worship, prayer, none of this has anything to do with Gautama Buddha's teachings. We have a follow-up from Judith on Zoom. She asks, is the Y crew a Buddhist ceremony then? When we honor Jivaka, the Buddha's doctor. Right, so a Y crew comes out of the Thai practices of uh, their, their animism, right? It's not part of Gautama Buddha's teachings, right? And I used to do Y crews a lot with my students in the Thai massage uh, tradition. But this is not part of Gautama Buddha's teachings because it's a rite, it's a ritual, it's a ceremony, it's a worship, right? So there's nothing that's part of that that is directly from Gautama Buddha's teachings. But what happened when the teachings spread from Sri Lanka into Thailand is people didn't just wipe away everything out of the Thai's practices and replace it with this pure Buddhism. Right. Buddhism probably came to Thailand about a thousand to twelve hundred years ago. The best that we can see through talking with various scholars and researchers. Now, it could have happened at different times, but who knows? But let's just say it came to Thailand about a thousand to twelve hundred years ago. Well, that was about thirteen hundred years after the Buddha died. So whatever the Thai people got in this transmission of Buddhism, sure, they had the pure teachings in there. But it was also wrapped in some other stuff. It wasn't just pure Buddhism that came to Thailand a thousand, twelve hundred years ago because it had already been affected by thirteen hundred years of impermanence. So this Buddhism comes into Thailand a thousand to twelve hundred years ago, already having been affected by impermanence. And the Thai people themselves were already practicing animism and all kinds of other teachings. They took these teachings and integrated them in to what they were already practicing, right? They didn't make an announcement that, hey, entire world of Thailand, we just got the pure teachings of the Buddha and starting on Monday, we're gonna go live with, with Theravada Buddhism 2.0, right? That's not how it worked. What happened is as these teachings came in and people kind of spread and gradually started sharing these teachings amongst Thai people and Thai culture, they blended them into their current practices. So things like Y Crew with the doctor of the Buddha and animistic practices of spirit houses, things like this, Hinduism, right? There's Thais that will respect Ganesh and other Brahmin uh, practices. All of this stuff just got integrated in and there are certain pockets of people in Thailand that know the pure teachings of the Buddha and practice those. And we know that that's what the pure teachings are. But there's plenty of people who don't. And the Y crew, while they'll attach it to Buddhism and say it's part of Buddhism, that just kind of gives it more credibility and more authenticity. But in reality, it's really not part of what the Buddha taught. One of the ways to make anything in Thailand more authentic with more credibility is somehow connected to Buddhism. If you can do that, then you can convince a large part of the population that these are teachings of the Buddha, if you can somehow connect it to Buddhism. So uh, the Y crew is not part of what the Buddha actually taught. And But does that say that the Y crew isn't helpful or isn't effective, right? So the Y crew is kind of like a ceremony where you come together, you do chants and 
uh, ceremony in order to kind of honor and respect the doctor of the Buddha. Well, from my experience in sharing this with students, it really helps to root them into the respect and politeness and traditions of Thailand and helps them to really appreciate this knowledge that has come down through this lineage of teachers. And then when they actually practice Thai massage, there's this deeper connection to the past and it kind of like feels good that you have this connection to the past. So the mind of the person can certainly feel this connection to the past, which may help them in their massage session, for example. But in terms of eliminating craving, anger, and ignorance, or unknowing a true reality, the self and the ego, the why crew by itself isn't doing that. No rites, rituals, ceremonies, or, or worship are actually going to change the condition of the mind. It's through other teachings and practices that we train the mind to improve the condition of the mind, not through rites, rituals, and ceremonies. We have a question from Amina. Because there are misunderstandings about the teachings and rituals, how should we go about visiting Buddhist temples, especially those outside of Thailand? There are a couple of temples here in Italy, and I imagine students living in other countries may have opportunities to visit temples as well. I'm wondering if after COVID, it would be a helpful idea to visit or not, and how can we understand if their practices align with what we are learning together with you? I think it's always helpful to visit temples. You're going to connect with other people who are on the path. You're going to be part of a community of people who are on the path. But what you're going to recognize is each temple you go to is very different because of impermanence. And each temple community and what they're practicing is going to be very different. Out of all the places that I've ever been, and I've probably been over 200 temples based in Thailand and America. I've never been to any temples in any other countries, but just temples in America and Thailand, well over 200. I've only ever visited one temple that was truly practicing very deeply as the way that I teach and the way that I describe out of all those temples. So when you go into a temple environment, you're going to see some of these things and you're going to experience some of these things. But if you know that they don't connect to the Buddhist teachings and they don't lead to the path to enlightenment, then you can just choose to not participate or you can just participate not knowing or, or knowing that they don't lead to enlightenment up to you. And that's one of the reasons why I share these things, because if you've been following along and learning with me, and you know that I've taught many times that rites, rituals, ceremonies, worship don't lead to enlightenment, but the first temple you go to, they're doing rites, rituals, ceremonies, and worship, you're gonna be like, hold on a second, what did David teach? So that's why here at the end of the book, after you've learned the Buddhist teachings all the way through this six month program and throughout this book, we get to the very end here and I'm kind of like, okay, what you just essentially learned are the Buddhist teachings, but now let me show you some things that you're going to see in today that really aren't the Buddhist teachings. And that's why I put this in there. So you can go to visit temples and you're going to see some of these things. And that's exactly why I'm sharing it so that you'll be able to identify it as not the Buddhist teachings. And then what you choose to do from there is up to you. I certainly suggest that you don't judge people, you don't have arrogance, you don't have ego, but you just see it for what it is. You know, I still go to plenty of events here in Thailand where there's various things going on that aren't part of the Buddhist teachings. And that's part of training the mind to be satisfied with what is, peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy, no matter what you're experiencing. So a big event that I went to about six months ago, at the beginning of the event, they had an enormous um, ceremony that has all kinds of animistic practices and Hindu practices, some Y crew stuff, all kinds of mixed bag of stuff. And that went on for like two or three hours. And the people who, you know, aren't into that stuff, they just they didn't go to that part of the temple because the temple is really big. They were doing it in one particular area and people just didn't go to that area. 
And the people who were interested in that, they went to that and did it. I actually went over there and watched them for a while and just to observe what they were doing. And then I and then I left. So part of this enlightened path is being able to be peaceful, calm, serene and content with joy, no matter what happens, what exists. So a lot of these temple environments, even if the main leader at the temple knows that certain things are not part of the Buddhist teachings, sometimes that leader will let those things still go on at the temple because that's one of the reasons why the people are coming. And once they arrive for that particular ceremony that he knows isn't part of the Buddhist teachings, they just happen to wander in and learn some of the teachings of the Buddha. Whereas if he kind of shunned all of this stuff and only taught the pure Buddhism, he may feel that people might not show up because it's such a superstitious place in Thailand, especially out in eastern Thailand. If he didn't allow those things at the temple, people may not have even shown up. So he kind of gets the chance to maybe teach him a little bit of the Dhamma gradually because they're showing up for these other ceremonies. So that may be the approach that those particular monks are taking in those particular temples. Where there's other places that I've been, this one particular temple in Bangkok, where that leader, he doesn't allow anything that doesn't have to do with the Buddha to happen at his temple. In fact, he doesn't even have a Buddha statue at his temple because he knows that's not part of the Buddhist teachings. He just has, it's just basically one big plot of land. It's a forest, essentially, and he's got a little wooden shack there, and he teaches. And on any given day, there'll be thousands and thousands and thousands of people that'll show up, sitting on the, on the ground, on the dirt, just to listen to him teach, because what he's teaching is so pure and so direct to the Buddhist teachings that his community just grows and grows and grows. The last time I went there, and I don't really understand what they're teaching because they're teaching in Thai, and uh, so I don't understand what they're teaching, but I observe what's going on. The last time I went there, I mean, 4 a.m. in the morning, we got there 4 a.m. in the morning, there was something like 20, 30, 50,000 people there at 4 a.m. in the morning, right? So you know something good must be going on at this temple if he got that many people there at 4 a.m. in the morning, right? So what I've observed is the places that are teaching the real pure Buddhist teachings, they grow quickly and there's lots of people that get lots and lots of benefit and that's the gamma, right? That's the result of these good wholesome teachings that goes out. You'll see that community will grow and grow and grow uh, exponentially, right? We have a question from Roxanne. Is the string different from prayer beads? Um, they are different, but it's a similar concept, right? Like prayer beads, there's nothing special or unique about them. They're just little pieces of wood or marble or whatever they made them out of with a string in them. These external objects, these external things, they don't produce enlightenment. All you need for enlightenment is the body, the mind, and the breath. That's all you need. The teachings, a teacher, and you actually practicing the teachings, right? These external things, strings on the wrist or these prayer beads or whatever, it's not part of what produces enlightenment. Otherwise, everybody would have to have these beads. And what's so special about these beads? What are they really doing? Right. And there's reasons why people use these beads, but they're not required in order to attain enlightenment. This is an external thing. Enlightenment is all internal. It's all in the mind. It's all training the mind. There's nothing external that's going to create enlightenment. We have a question from Padakanti. Sir, some people say that the Buddha became enlightened through Vipassana meditation. I also hear that mere intellectual understanding is not enough and we should experience it in our very self. Please clarify. You're correct about intellectual understanding of the teachings are not going to lead to enlightenment. This is what I say. We need to first intellectually understand the teachings. Then we need to practice them so that you can see the truth and gain wisdom. I also talk about this as soaking the teachings into the mind, 
right, through practice the te practicing the teachings. But there needs to be an intellectual understanding at the beginning and as you're learning the teachings so that then you can apply them in practice and see the results of the teachings themselves. That's how you soak the teachings into the mind by gaining this wisdom, independently observing the truth for yourself, you will then gain wisdom and actually see that the teachings are working. So that part for sure. Vipassana meditation, I've never learned Vipassana meditation. I've never gone to one of their retreats. And the people that have gone, that I've talked to, it sounds like what they're teaching, at least in the first couple of days, is what I would call breathing mindfulness meditation and what I saw in the Buddhist teachings as breathing mindfulness meditation. There's plenty of people in the world that are practicing Vipassana meditation. Uh, so if it's beneficial for you and it's working, great. But what I teach you is what I know works. And I confirm it in four ways. First, I have to see it in the Buddhist teachings. I have to see it in the Pali Canon. And if I see it there, then I say, okay, this might be true. I don't even believe the Pali Canon. I say, okay, it's in the Pali Canon. It might be true. Because remember, we're 2,500 years after the Buddha's death. I don't necessarily know that this particular book that I'm reading, I don't know where these particular writings came from and how many different translators it took to get to me. So I don't even believe these books, but I have to see it in there first. And then I say, OK, this might be true. Then I take that teaching and I practice it for myself. When I practice it, I look over the course of many days and weeks and months is it improving the condition of the mind? If it is, then I know it's truth and it's working. Then I try to communicate it and teach it to students. And I talk to the students and I teach the students. Then I check with the students and see if it works for them. And then yes, it works for them. And then the fourth place is in the Thai community Oftentimes, Thai people will see that I'm teaching and they'll sit down with me somewhere and they'll say, OK, what do you teach for meditation? And then I will tell them, you know, I teach this, 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 this and this. And they say, oh, that's interesting. I just spent two weeks at a temple up north with this really well-known enlightened master who we all know in the community is enlightened. And he teaches the same thing that you teach. So that confirms four different ways for me. One, I've got to see it in the Pali Canon to clue me in that that might be the truth. Then I practice it for myself first. And then when I see it works for me, then I know it's the truth. But I don't stop there. I share it with students. It works for them. And then someone in the community, people in the community, confirm for me that what I'm sharing is the truth. And when the Thai people do that with me, not just Thai people, but ordained practitioners as well, because some of my students and some of my friends are ordained, they will sit with me and talk with me and ask me what I'm teaching and how I teach it. And they will confirm that what I'm teaching is what they learn in Thai. So that's how I confirm what I'm doing. So I've never actually learned Vipassana, so I can't speak on whether that's true or false. All I can tell you is what I've learned in the Pali Canon, what I experience works, what works for the students I teach, and what the Thai people share with me that work that they're doing in their community. And from what I understand, Vipassana involves body scanning and different things like this. I haven't ex been exposed to that in the Pali Canon, so therefore I've never actually practiced it for myself, and I've never shared it with students, and I've never talked with a Thai person who's actually done it either. And at this point in my practice, I don't have a need for that practice, but if it's working for somebody and they feel that it's improving the condition of their mind, then that's great and more power to them. But I, there's nothing that I've seen that the Buddha said that he practiced Vipassana meditation. I haven't even seen the word Vipassana in the Pali Canon itself. I've never seen where it exists. And I talked with a translator who does translations of Pali text, and I asked him to send me from the Pali Canon where Vipassana meditation is taught. And he sent me one little tiny blurb, but it wasn't 
it wasn't vipassana meditation it, it didn't even have the word vipassana in it so um but if it works for people and they find it helpful then i'm pleased for them and pleased for their success <laughs> we have a question from Messia. what is your view on practicing noble silence for periods of time or on retreat please david i don't agree with practicing noble silence and here's the reason why um well let me back up for a second i think noble silence can be beneficial in certain situations if someone's used to talking a lot and they just talk and talk and talk and talk frivolous speech without having awareness of mind noble silence for a period of time can be helpful for them to go inside of their mind and really observe and reflect on what's in the mind but then what i think they need to get to is right speech because you can't stay quiet in order to get to enlightenment so if someone goes off into a cave for 10 years or 20 years and completely remain silent their entire time and then they come out of the cave i wouldn't consider that person enlightened because part of the path the third step is right speech so in order to become enlightened you need to know how to practice right speech right speech involves the five factors of well-spoken speech which is speaking at the right time what you say is true what you speak is spoken gently it's beneficial it's spoken with a mind of loving kindness and it's blameless so you're not blaming other people so if you're in a retreat environment for 10 days or 20 days or 30 days and you're quiet for the entire period that might produce some kind of benefit for you and if it does i'm glad for you but the type of retreats that i aim to teach are retreats where people are quiet for about three hours in uh, a class in the morning where we're actually teaching but you can ask questions and then there's some quiet time in the evening for about two or three hours where we're teaching but you're also asking questions during the class but all during the day i allow the students and practitioners to talk and i encourage them if they would like to talk to talk because i would like them to practice right speech i know that it's important for them to practice right speech and learn how to do that and the best way to learn how to practice right speech is in an environment where they can practice kind of like a laboratory and learn right speech so in real life life is like wide open people can say and do whatever they want right that's not going to necessarily lead to enlightenment if people speak with hate or discrimination or aggression or hostility that's not going to be enlightenment if we are completely silent that's not going to lead to enlightenment either so what i do is i teach people to come to the middle which is practice right speech using these five factors of well-spoken speech in an environment where they have guidance and they can be guided to learn how to use right speech and practice it not just speech but all communication email tax facebook posts and all of these things so in the retreats that i host i even allow the students to have their electronic devices where a lot of retreats not only are you in noble silence but they take away your electronic devices too because they don't want you to be impacted by things that are going on at home and things like this but for me if we're in a 10-day retreat and you get an email three days in that your husband or your wife is missing you like crazy and your kids are being disruptive or whatever i would like you to bring that into the talk and i would like you to bring that to me and say david can you give me some guidance on this how can i deal with this back home because that's a perfect opportunity for you to learn and practice the teachings and apply them to everyday life if you're in a retreat environment where of course at home everything's wide open but in a retreat environment if everything's completely closed for 10 days you might experience a wonderful perfect time for 10 days but then when you go back home and that switch is flipped and now things are wide open again your practice can fall apart so what i aim to do in retreats is kind of create this middle way where 
you're not completely wide open, but you're not completely shut off either. And you have this opportunity to learn the teachings day by day and then apply them in life with the other people that are in the retreat, but also people at home who might be messaging you. And I think this is a much better way to learn the teachings and then slowly integrate them into your life so that then when you go back home, it's not like your husband or wife or partners or friends or children haven't heard from you for 10 days or 20 days or 30 days. And now it's just wide open to mom or dad or boyfriends, girlfriends and friends that you can kind of slowly integrate the teachings over the time of the retreat and then slowly integrate into being back home. I think this is a much more conducive way to help people build a life practice, to help you develop a life practice that can really be sustained over a long period of time. So if you come to a retreat with me, whether it's here in Thailand or somewhere else in the world, that's the way that I structure the retreats, is that there's this middle where things aren't completely shut off, but things aren't completely wide open either. And you can gradually, slowly learn the teachings and apply them to your life. We have a question from Fakir. He says, thanks for this discussion. I'm a Sufi Muslim from Bangladesh. Whatever religion we belong to, we should only need to find the truth. If there is no self which we can see if we observe deeply, what is going to rebirth? Why don't we see rebirth as we see non-self? These are some of the questions I asked you to hold to the end, but it's okay. We can talk about them. Ah, uh, <laughs> that's all right. Um, uh, so, actually, let's hold this one to the end, Max, because I want to make sure we cover. Let's hold that one. Yeah, let's hold that one because that's a bigger question. Okay. We'll get to your yeah, question, sure. but I want to make sure we get through the, the teachings that we had planned for today, and then we'll get to the rebirth question. Okay. We have a question from, okay, we have a question from Judith. How can we talk about traditional Thai medicine as a branch of Buddhist medicine, and then some practices are magic incantation, toxin, spirit medicine, massage with fire for exorcism, and so on? How should we see these practices? Is the focus on healing in order to be able to cultivate a spiritual path? Let's talk about this one at the end too. Okay. So the last one is uh, about uh, rites and rituals. So we have a question. Hello, sir. There is one form of Nichiren Buddhism, or there is a form of Buddhism called Nichiren Buddhism, mm -hmm. which is based on chanting. Nam Yoho Renge Kyo. Many have changed their life by doing it. How does it work? It's from the Lotus Sutra. Okay, let's wait till we get to the next one. We're going to talk about chanting and mantras. Okay. Okay. All right. So, this next slide that I have here, number four, is talking about the ordained practitioners, bhikkhus and bhikkhunis. OK, here what I'm sharing is kind of cluing the ordained practitioners in who study with me that some of the things that they've been taught and that have been handed down over the years are not actually Gautama Buddhist teachings because these teachings have been handed down from master to master to master to master. And people have been influenced by different things and not everything that the ordained practitioners are practicing is actually the Buddhist teachings. The perception from most people from the outside looking in is that if somebody has on a Buddhist robe and they've shaved their head, they must know the Buddhist teachings, right? Because they're a Buddhist monk. Well, the reality of the matter is, is that all of these people are human beings, just like you and I, okay? They are at different parts of the path. You can see people that are novice monks, as little as 6, 8, 10, 12 years old, or you might see people as old as 80, 90 years old who are monks, and people ordain at different periods of time in their life. You could see a 60 or 80 year old man who just ordained last week. It doesn't mean that they've been steeped in the Buddha's teachings, and even if they've been ordained for 40, 50, 60 years, it doesn't mean that they're very close to the Buddha's teachings. Another thing from the outside looking in is you would think that every single Buddhist monk 
must have access to the teachings of the Buddha, right? Because they're a Buddhist monk. You know, we tend to think from the Christian background that the Bible is like yay thick and everybody must have a copy of that. If they're a Buddhist monk, they must have a copy. Well, the reality of the matter is the Buddhist teachings are in 45 volumes of books that are this thick. OK, this is about, you know, four, five, six inches thick or we might say maybe 10 centimeters, right? 45 volumes of this, okay? You're not carrying that around in your bag, right? Most temples will have a version of the Pali Canon at the temple. However, what condition and what quality of translations that temple has is different from every temple to every temple. And most of these temples are gonna have these teachings in Thai, or in Pali. There's very few people in the world that have picked up all 45 books and read them cover to cover. And those people that have done that, they can't really recall or remember everything that they've read, and they certainly haven't soaked in everything that they've read into the mind and actually practicing it. So what most of these books are for is they're in the temples, but they're there for references every once in a while every once in a blue moon a monk might get up and go look at the reference mostly what people are learning is what's been handed down from person to person to person one of the things that you'll see in the ordained community is that if you're a household practitioner and you come around ordained practitioners you might decide to why them to show respect and you should to show respect to everybody everyone in the world we're all the same. As you why an ordained practitioner, what they've been taught is to not why back, okay? Ordained practitioners will typically not why a household practitioner. I've had a few ordained practitioners that have why me, but the vast majority don't, and this is what they've been taught. They've been taught that because they follow 227 precepts, that they're higher than lay people and because of that they shouldn't why us back okay to me this is one of those cultural things that ties do that aren't keeping in line with the buddhist teachings and here's the reason why the buddha taught all beings are the same all beings are equal there's nobody above or below another being he also taught us to eliminate arrogance and conceit and eliminating the ego, thinking that one person is more special than the other. Well, if somebody walks around thinking that because I accepted these 227 precepts, I'm higher than these lay people, and when lay people or householders why me, I'm not gonna why them back because I'm higher than they are. This is arrogance, this is conceit, and it's going to inhibit that person from attaining enlightenment. So to me, that's not in keeping with the Buddhist teachings. I will probably never ordain as a monk for my entire life. But if I were to ordain, I would be whying every single person that I saw. This is one of the reasons why I don't ordain, because I would cause problems within the ordain uh, community, because I would be whying every single person that I saw. And I wouldn't be waiting for them to why me first, and then whying back, I would just be whying everybody that I saw because I would be showing respect and gratitude because as an ordained practitioner, it's the household practitioners that go out and work and labor and sweat and tears and make all this money and then buy supplies and give it to the ordained practitioners. And they give this offering to the ordained practitioners. If I was an ordained practitioner, I would have enormous amounts of gratitude for that. Enormous amounts. And I would why them back. In fact, the people who make donations to me, I make a very concerted effort to show my appreciation and gratitude to every single person who makes a donation to me. Because I know whether it's $5 or $10 or $100 or $300, that person put in a lot of time, effort, and energy in order to acquire that money. And if they're giving it to me as a donation, that is an enormous amount of gratitude and appreciation that I then have 
for that person. So as ordained practitioners, if we were walking around with arrogance and conceit that because we happen to have 227 precepts, we don't need to show respect to other people, this is, this is conceit and arrogance. And in fact, there's plenty of Buddhist practitioners who are ordained. They might have 227 precepts, but they're not practicing all 227. You would assume that every Buddhist ordained practitioner that you see is practicing all 227. But see, that's the mind craving permanence. If you understand impermanence, then you know out of all the Buddhist ordained practitioners in the world, they're not practicing all the 227 precepts. In fact, there's Buddhist pra ordained practitioners who aren't even practicing the five precepts. They're not even practicing the five precepts. I've talked with monks that are drunk, that drink alcohol. I've talked with monks that use profanity. I know of monks who have committed sexual misconduct and had sex with children, right? There is these things that happen in the world because these ordained practitioners, they're not a Buddha. They're not perfectly fully enlightened. So therefore, they still have craving, anger, ignorance, a self, and an ego. So these teachings that have been handed down from master to master to master, if the ordained practitioners are walking around that they're not going to show respect to others because they have accepted 227 precepts, they may not even be practicing the first five where household practitioners may be actually practicing more deeply than them. So if ordained practitioners really want to look at attaining enlightenment, they need to look closely at what their teachers are teaching them and make sure that they adopt their practice to what the Buddha actually taught. Because there are certainly ordained practitioners who do show respect to household practitioners. I've seen plenty and I've met plenty that are very humble, very peaceful, very loving, very caring, very kind, very compassionate. And these people will why or they will show respect to household practitioners because they don't view themselves as higher than somebody else. And these are the more enlightened practitioners that are ordained. So just keep in mind that when you go around ordained practitioners, the vast majority of them aren't going to why you. They're not going to bow and show respect to you. Hopefully over time that will change, but that's their practice. What they choose to do is up to them. If I was ordained, I would certainly show respect to everybody and anybody, okay? That's what the Buddha did. In fact, I know of a story talking about Javaka Komarabhaka, which is the Buddha's doctor. I know of a story where the Buddha actually became ill at one point, and he went to his doctor to get healing. And the doctor said to him, he said, okay, what's your problem? You know, the Buddha told him, he gave him the remedy, but he didn't tell him 100% of what he's supposed to do in order to get healthy. He just said, here, do these kind of nine things. And if you're truly a Buddha, you already know what to do for the 10th thing, right? He left it off. So the Buddha goes away, he does those nine things, he figures out the 10th thing on his own, and then he comes back to the doctor and he tells the doctor he's a very good doctor he appreciates his care and he wise the doctor thanking him for his service and the doctor says well what did you do for that tenth thing and then the buddha told him what did he do and then the doctor says oh master guotsama it's not you who should be whying me it's me that should be whying you. So he knew, the doctor knew at that moment that the Buddha is a true Buddha because he figured out what that 10th thing was by himself. But you can see from this story that the Buddha actually whied his doctor first, right? A perfectly enlightened Buddha isn't walking around with arrogance thinking, I'm so enlightened. I'm fully, perfectly enlightened. I'm so enlightened. I'm not going to why anyone. 
all those lower people that are low below me, those are the ones that have to why me. I'm fully and perfectly enlightened. I don't have to show respect to them. That's not what a fully perfectly enlightened Buddha does. That's not what a fully perfectly enlightened Buddha thinks. A fully perfectly enlightened Buddha, sure, he's got to enlighten him by himself, but he's eliminated the ego. He's eliminated conceit. He loves all beings. He has care for all beings. He has kindness, politeness, compassion for all beings. And he has respect for all beings. That's what a fully perfectly enlightened Buddha does. So if that's what a fully perfectly enlightened Buddha does, why do we have ordained practitioners walking around not showing respect to household practitioners? Because they still have ego because they still have arrogance, because they're not yet fully enlightened, right? So ordained practitioners really need to look at what they've been taught throughout their life and throughout their lineage and understand that a fully perfectly enlightened Buddha doesn't walk around with conceit thinking that I'm following more precepts, therefore I'm not gonna show respect to everybody else. This isn't a teaching of the Buddha that has been shared with ordained practitioners. And because ordained practitioners are practicing this way, it's inhibiting them from attaining enlightenment. It's inhibiting them because they still have conceit. They still have arrogance. And this is why we don't see an enormous population of ordained practitioners who are enlightened. There's very few in the world, very, very few ordained practitioners in the world who are enlightened. And this is one of the main reasons why, is because they've been taught conceit and arrogance as part of their teachings. What Gautama Buddha taught is to eliminate conceit and arrogance. And that's what the ordained practitioners need to do. This fifth one, chanting and mantras. It's important to understand that chanting has been handed down from generation to generation in order to remember the teachings. That was the primary method of remembering the teachings from one generation to the next, is through chanting and developing mindfulness or awareness of mind, developing concentration, developing memory. And that's why people chant, is to hand down the teachings throughout generations. What has happened in modern day society, and this goes to some of the questions that people asked, what happens in modern day society is people start thinking that these chants and these mantras have special powers, superstitious powers. It's not true. It's not what Gautama Buddha taught. What you can develop with chanting is you can develop concentration, you can develop memory, you can develop mindfulness and awareness of mind, you can ease the mind into meditation and get more benefit out of the meditation, but the chant by itself does not have any special, miraculous, superstitious, magical, mystical powers. That's not the way the Buddhist teachings work. The way the Buddhist teachings work is by training the mind through practice, developing concentration, developing single-mindedness, developing the whole Eightfold Path. The Eightfold Path is the path to enlightenment. There is nowhere on the Eightfold Path that the Buddha says, right chanting or right mantra. It's right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration. There's nowhere on the path that is right chanting or right mantra because by themselves, they don't produce enlightenment. There's plenty of people in the world that are enlightened that don't actually chant, that don't do mantras. That's one of the ways that we know it's not part of the path. As most of you guys know, I do chanting and I teach chanting because I found it to be beneficial in terms of developing concentration, developing awareness of mind, developing memorization, developing awareness of breath, 
and then easing the mind into meditation, getting more benefit out of the meditation, and then easing the mind out of the meditation. But I do this chanting as a way to get more benefit out of the meditation. But by themselves, they don't lead to enlightenment. In fact, when I meditate, I chant probably 99.9% .9 of the time, but there's certainly times where I don't chant, right? So it's important that if somebody is teaching you chanting, that you understand there's no mystical, magical, superstitious powers associated with the chant by itself. That's not Gautama Buddha's teachings. That's a misunderstanding of his teachings that some people have chosen to take on, but it's not truth. If it is truth, that those things do lead to enlightenment, they do have mystical and special powers, then you should be able to do those chants and instantly become enlightened. And if it was true, you would see in this Pali Canon where the Buddha says, make sure you chant every day these words, because these words, if you chant them every day, will lead to your enlightenment. He never says that. He never says it. So he never says it in the Pali Canon. If you do it yourself, you're going to see that chanting by itself doesn't lead to enlightenment. If you try to teach it to other people, it's not going to lead to their enlightenment. And if you talk to other practitioners who are considered to be enlightened or close to it, you'll see that people know that chanting by itself doesn't lead to enlightenment. You can disagree with that, but I can share with you that the Buddha never ever taught chanting as a way to lead to enlightenment. It's not part of the path, but you can incorporate it into your practice and make it beneficial if you relate it to the path in terms of concentration, mindfulness, memory, and getting more benefit out of your meditation. That's how you incorporate it to make it more beneficial to your practice. The sixth thing that I'll share here is about Buddha statues. Throughout the world, there's many different places that have statues of the Buddha. And what you'll observe is that every single place will have a statue that looks slightly different. And the reason why is because everybody's trying to cast statues that looks like their culture. So if you look at Thai statues, the Thai statues look somewhat Thai. The Chinese statues look fairly Chinese. The Japanese look very Japanese. Every culture kind of casts a statue that looks similar to their culture. But in reality, the Buddha didn't teach anybody to create a statue of him. The Buddha didn't teach anyone to worship a statue. The Buddha didn't teach anyone to bow down to a statue. The Buddha didn't even teach to worship him because he knew that worshiping him isn't going to lead to your enlightenment. And he didn't want to put himself up on a pedestal, right? He viewed people as all being equal. So this practice of creating Buddha statues is not something that comes from the Buddha. Does that mean you can't have a Buddha statue? It's up to you if you would like to have a statue of the Buddha. At one time in my life, I had many, 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 many statues. And I realized that that's not what leads to enlightenment. So I let them all go, right? So if you decide to have a Buddha statue, that's up to you. It can help remind you to practice by seeing that every day. That's what it did for me at that particular time. But don't be surprised if at some point in your practice, you decide to let it go. However, if you have this statue and you bow down to it, you feed it water, you feed it food, you think that the spirit of the Buddha is in that statue, you pray to that statue asking for certain things, this is all wrong view. This is all wrong observances and wrong behaviors. And this is going to inhibit you from enlightenment. So if you're constantly bowing to statues, feeding statues, worshiping statues, thinking that there's a spirit in those statues, then that's going to inhibit your enlightenment because you can't even get to the first stage of enlightenment practicing and believing that way. Now, there's other people who will bow to statues and they'll say, well, I'm doing this in order to show my appreciation and gratitude to the Buddha, even though I know he's gone. And I'm doing this in order to eliminate my ego. 
I'm doing this to eliminate my arrogance. And this is my way to humble myself. Okay, that's part of the path, right? So if somebody wants to use bowing to the statues in that way to eliminate arrogance and ego, wonderful, great. But if they're doing these other things that I mentioned that involve rites, rituals, and ceremonies in worship, then they're going to find it very difficult to ever attain enlightenment because they're not even practicing right view yet, which is the first step on the Eightfold Path. So any questions on these three? So we have a question about chanting that came in earlier. So Pratik on YouTube says, Hello, sir. There is one form of Buddhism called Nichiren Buddhism, which is based on chanting, Nam Myoho Rengo Kyo. Many have changed their life by doing it. How does it work? I guess you might have already answered this, but I thought I would ask this anyway. Yeah, so what I would say is you need to go to a teacher in that sect of Buddhism and ask them how does it work. Because from my perspective, it doesn't work. That's not what's changing their life. Just chanting, even in the Theravada tradition, Namo Tassa Pakawato. Okay, I can do that 24 hours a day. But if I get up and I go talk to my wife rudely or hostile, this chant hasn't changed anything. Or if I chant and I go outside and I steal a car, this chant hasn't changed anything. It's not the chant that is changing anything. You have to change the mind. You have to eliminate craving, anger, ignorance, the self, and the ego. By doing that, that is what's creating the change, is your personal decisions are creating the change, not the chant itself, right? Because people can meditate 23 hours a day and get up off the cushion and go outside and steal something and unwholesome things are gonna to happen to them. They're not enlightened. I don't care how many chants they say or how long they meditate for, right? The chants and how long you meditate is not an indicator of whether somebody's enlightened or not. It just isn't. It's just a chant and how long someone meditated for. It's about your practice. It's about how do you practice in daily life and a chant is not gonna change the quality of the mind by itself. It's not going to eliminate craving. It's not going to eliminate hatred or anger. It's not going to eliminate ignorance or unknowing of true reality. It's not going to eliminate the self, and it's not going to eliminate the ego. There's no, no special magical mystical powers about a chant. It's just sound coming out of the mouth. There's nothing mystical or magical or superstitious about Gautama Buddha's teachings. Thanks, David. I suggest we save the other couple of questions to the end. Okay, sounds good. So let's go to this particular reading here. I shared this in the book because it relates to the ordained practitioners, but it also relates to us too. This is really important here, what the Buddha is sharing with us. This is the Buddha's words. He's talking about pride here, okay? And he's talking about an enlightened being. So the title of this is Gain, Honor, and Praise Are Obstacles Even for an Arahant. An Arahant is an enlightened being, the fourth stage of enlightenment. That's when you've attained enlightenment. So he's saying, Bhikkhus, gain, honor, and praise, I say, are an obstacle even for a bhikkhu who is an Arahant, one with taints destroyed. Taint is the um, fetters, the um, 10 fetters. So if you've eliminated all 10 fetters, you've destroyed the taints. And essentially you are an Arahant, you are enlightened when you destroy all the taints. So he's saying here, gain honor and praise, I say are an obstacle, even for a bhikkhu who is an Arahant, one with taints destroyed. When this was said, the venerable Ananda, Ananda is the Buddha's closest student. He was with him his entire life of teaching from the age of 35 all the way until he died. Ananda was with the Buddha. So when this was said, the venerable Ananda asked the master teacher Gautama, why, venerable sir, are 
gain honor and praise an obstacle even for a bhikkhu with taints destroyed. Okay, now the Buddha starts talking again. I do not say, Ananda, that gain honor and praise are an obstacle to his unshakable liberation of mind, but, right, so if the mind's already liberated, it's unshakable. So the Buddha is saying these things aren't Un, these things aren't an obstacle to his already liberated mind, but I say they are an obstacle to his attainment of. So before somebody gets to enlightenment, this gain, honor, and praise is an obstacle to his attainment of those pleasant dwellings in this very life which are achieved by one who dwells diligent, ardent, and resolute. So dreadful, Ananda, are gain, honor, and praise, so bitter, vile, obstructive to achieving the unsurpassed security from bondage. This is like the mind being uh, inhibited and burdened by this craving, anger, and ignorance, unknowing of true reality. Therefore, Ananda, you should train yourselves thus. We will abandon the arisen, gain, honor, praise, and we will not let the arisen, gain, honor, and praise persist, obsessing our mind. Thus, should you train yourselves. What he's saying here is, you know how sometimes you might do something good just because you want other people to praise you for it, or you've done something good and you want other people to acknowledge that and praise you for it. What the Buddha is saying here is, this is going to inhibit you from attaining enlightenment. Because if somebody's only doing something because they want praise, or once they've done something good, if they want praise for that, that means they're not doing it with pure intentions. They're not doing it with pure intentions. If you're doing these teachings, if you're practicing these teachings with pure intentions, you will just do it because it's the right thing to do. Not because somebody told you to do it, not because you're looking for praise, not because you're looking to look higher than other beings, right? You're just practicing these good teachings. You're learning and practicing them because you know it's the right thing to do and it's good and it's wholesome and it's leading you on this path to enlightenment where you're liberated from this bondage, from this burden on the mind. By practicing these good wholesome teachings, you're liberating the mind. So you practicing with right intentions through practicing right speech and right actions, you're doing these things because they're just the right thing to do, not because you're looking for praise. That's essentially what he's talking about here. And this leads to the next one as well. I share this because it's important for you to practice this and it relates to the bhikkhus who aren't whying other people, who aren't whying household practitioners because if there's conceit and there's arrogance and they're just looking for praise because look at me, I'm a bhikkhu, I've decided to give up my life and go into homelessness and put on this orange robe. And therefore, because I put on this orange robe and shave my hair, everybody should why me and I don't have to why them. And I don't have to show respect to other people. Then this is craving gain, honor and praise. This is not abandoning the intention and the pure intention to just go be a bhikkhu because it's the right thing to do. And this next one illustrates this even more. This one says, this spiritual life is not lived for the sake of deceiving people. Bhikkhus, this spiritual life is not lived for the sake of deceiving people or cajoling them, nor for the benefit of gain, honor, and praise, nor for the benefit of winning in debates, nor with the thought let the people know me thus, but rather this spiritual life is lived for the sake of restraint, abandoning, dispassion, and cessation. What he's saying here 
is that this life living in the way of his teachings it's not to be done to deceive people you might learn the right things to do and you just do those right things to get what you want but then in the background you're really kind of like making unwholesome decisions you're only being sweet and kind and friendly up front because you know that that's going to help you get what you want but then in the background you're kind of like doing things more scrupulously right or you're choosing to live this life because you're looking for gain honor and praise oh wow look at david he's a teacher of the dhamma he shares the teachings with so many people isn't he so wonderful and so great well if that's the reason why i'm teaching and sharing these teachings it's the wrong reason right nobody should be sharing these teachings and nobody should be practicing these teachings just because they're looking for gain honor and praise you should be doing it because you know it's a good wholesome purpose it's a good wholesome thing to be doing additionally he talks about winning in debates here once you become enlightened your mind has so much clarity so much concentration so much memory so much focus right that you can actually debate or discuss pretty much any topic with anybody and you can kind of show them the truth through presenting examples to help them see what the real truth is so if somebody's learning these teachings and practicing these teachings because they want to win arguments or they want to win debates with the thought let the people know me thus right this is ego let the people know me because i learned the teaching so well i know all these things so well let the people know how great and wonderful i am the buddha is saying no that's not why to learn these teachings he says but rather this spiritual life is lived for the sake of restraint abandoning dispassion in cessation what he's saying is restraint like abandoning like holding yourself back from killing from stealing from sexual misconduct from lying from substances that cause heedlessness abandoning those things and restraining the mind from doing those things and when he talks about cessation he's saying this spiritual life is lived for the sake of cessation cessation is elimination of discontentedness elimination of the suffering that is caused by discontentedness that's the reason why this life is lived for your own liberation for your own enlightenment for your own nibbana for you to eliminate discontentedness in the suffering that it causes that's the only reason why these teachings are shared and the only reason why you should be interested in learning them not because you're interested in praise honor and gain right not because you want to win arguments let the people know me thus look how much i know about the buddhist teachings that's not why we're learning and practicing these teachings you're learning and practicing these teachings to eliminate your discontentedness your suffering your discontent feelings sadness anger frustration irritation guilt shame fears boredom loneliness shyness resentment jealousy you're learning these teachings for you and only you and you're doing these things for your own benefit which you know is going to then benefit those close to you and all of humanity but you're doing them because they're good wholesome teachings and it's going to help you in your life not because you're trying to look good for other people okay that's why the bhikkhus need to learn to be humble and peaceful and show respect to all of these household practitioners that are supporting them in their life to be a bhikkhu or a bikini okay so let's go to this last one which is number seven eight and nine number seven is talking about Gautama Buddha as a god an avatar or a lord there are some communities that will talk about Gautama Buddha in this way Gautama Buddha never talked about himself as a god he never discussed himself as a god he but other people do he never discussed himself as an avatar but other people do 
And I gave definitions in the book of how I'm defining a god and an avatar so you understand that Gautama Buddha was not a god or an avatar. He was a human being. He was a teacher. He was a man, never asking to be worshipped. There's also communities of people that refer to Gautama Buddha as Lord Buddha or the Lord Buddha. This one is really important that we clean up our language around this because there are certain communities that refer to Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior or as the only Lord and Savior. The goal of Gautama Buddha was to share his teachings with the entire world because he knew that these are the teachings that lead to liberation of the mind. These are teachings that lead to the elimination of discontentedness. All that suffering, anger, sadness, fears, all of that can be eliminated through his teachings. So if we are interested in helping these teachings reach the entire world so that they can be liberated from these discontent feelings, if we use this word Lord, it's going to cause a lot of conflict within communities of people who are already practicing things like Christianity because they view Jesus Christ as the only Lord and Savior. So if we call Gautama Buddha Lord Buddha, then immediately there's like two billion people who would never practice Gautama Buddha's teachings because we're calling him the Lord Buddha. But if you look at the definition of what a Lord is, the Buddha is not a Lord. He never described himself as a Lord. So why would we describe him as a Lord? The way people refer to Lord and the way it's defined is someone of having power, authority, or influence, a master or a ruler, an act in a superior and domineering way towards someone. Now, if you ever see a description that is more opposite of the Buddha. This Lord, this title Lord is completely opposite of what Gautama Buddha did. Gautama Buddha was a prince destined to be a king. He stepped down to be a homeless beggar on the street, begging for food, essentially, accepting whatever was given to him, eating whatever was given to him, essentially a homeless person, right? He taught to be humble, caring, loving, kind. All people are equal. He didn't teach someone of having power, authority, or influence, a master or a ruler. He didn't teach to be superior and domineering towards someone. He didn't teach that. So he didn't use the word Lord. The way that we use the word Lord in our current language doesn't reflect the way that he taught. So why would we use the word Lord to refer to the Buddha? And my conclusion is we shouldn't. We shouldn't call him a God, an avatar, or a Lord. We should refer to him as a teacher or a master teacher, basically a really high teacher, because during his lifetime, he referred to himself as aesthetic Gautama or Tathagata, right? Basically, monk Gautama. He never even, if ever, referred to himself as a Buddha, right? It wasn't until later after he died that people started calling him a Buddha. He didn't walk around like, I'm the Buddha. Look at me. I'm so high and mighty. You low people are below me. You know, I'm so high and mighty. He didn't walk around that way. He was very humble, very gentle, very loving, very kind, very down to earth, peaceful, right? This is what a Buddha, a fully perfectly enlightened Buddha is going to do. So we should be sure that we use the right way to refer to him. The Buddha, Gautama Buddha, teacher Gautama, master teacher Gautama. All of these things are fitting where these other titles aren't really fitting. The eighth one here, we already talked about blessings a little bit, where nothing in the Buddhist teachings are about blessings. What a blessing is defined as in today's language is God's favor and protection, a prayer asking for God's favor and protection. So if someone's telling you that this water that they made with a candle is blessed water, 
Well, the Buddha never taught that because he didn't teach to ask for God's favor and protection. He didn't ask, he didn't teach to ask for things in prayer for favor and protection. So there is no blessings in the Buddhist teachings. The Buddha didn't walk around blessing people as part of what he did. He shared teachings, encouraged people to practice those, and then supported and guided them to attain enlightenment through those teachings. He never blessed people. And he never created anything that was considered blessed water. So oftentimes people will say, may the Buddha bless you, or may the triple gem bless you, or may the triple jewel bless you, right? Or things like this. These are all people kind of mixing modern day language with what the Buddha taught. There's no blessings in the Buddha's teachings, right? There's just learn, practice, and experience the results. That's it. And if you do that and you keep it simple and you do that, learn, practice, experience the results, you're going to be very happy with those results. Very pleased, very well taken care of, peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy. Okay, but no blessings. And now the ninth one. There's some traditions that say that you are a Buddha. Or they'll say, if you've attained enlightenment, you have attained Buddhahood. Or they will say, you have Buddha nature. Okay, this is completely opposite of what Gautama Buddha taught. He never taught that you are a Buddha. Okay. There's in chapter three, there's criteria that I shared about what a Buddha is. I'll give you just a couple of those things. A Buddha is a self-awakened individual who attains enlightenment on their own through their own journey. Through their self-awakening, they share teachings that lead to the awakening of countless other people during their lifetime. And then once they die, countless other people become enlightened through those same teachings. There's other criteria as well, but these are the kind of top three criteria, right? The Buddha is the originator, the discoverer, the declarer of the path to enlightenment. He was self-awakened. He shared these teachings. Countless other people became enlightened. He established the ordained community of practitioners. He worked for 45 years to share these teachings with people and countless other people have gotten enlightened over the 2,500 years since his death. That's what a Buddha does. That's why we still talk about him today, 2,500 years later, because he is a true Buddha. You can become enlightened. You can become enlightened, but you won't be a Buddha. You aren't going to do those same things that he did as a Buddha. So, while you may be in communities of people that might tell you that you are a Buddha or you are going to attain Buddhahood or you have Buddha nature, this isn't what the Buddha taught. You will never see that in his teachings whatsoever. You will never see him talk about Buddhahood or Buddha nature, and he'll never refer to anyone else as a Buddha. He very rarely, if ever, even refers to himself as a Buddha. There's only one place that I've seen that he may be referred to himself as a Buddha, but I've seen different translations. There was a place where somebody asked him, you know, what are you? Are you a God? Are you a human? Are you this? Are you that? What are you? One translation I saw, he said, remember this Brahmin, I am a Buddha. Okay, that's one translation. The other translation that I think is more accurate, someone said, what are you, a god? Are you a, a, a Brahmin? You know, are you, you know, a human? What are you? The other translation says, remember this Brahmin, I'm awake, right? He said, I'm awake. And I think that's probably a more accurate translation. So out of 45 volumes of these, there's only that one place that I've seen where he even maybe refers to himself as a Buddha. So he certainly didn't refer to you as a Buddha or me as a Buddha or somebody else as a Buddha. So 
You can attain enlightenment as an arahant and be an enlightened being, but you'll never be a Buddha. You'll never attain Buddhahood and you don't have Buddha nature. You have the ability to attain enlightenment and experience this permanent mental state of peace, calm, serenity, and contentness with joy, but you won't go to the great lengths that the Buddha went to to self-awaken, to share the teachings with countless people, and after your death, countless people will become enlightened through those teachings. If anybody is referring to themselves this way, I would consider it ego and putting themselves up on the same level as Gautama Buddha. And at the very least, what they're doing is they're not respecting the Buddha for the hard work that he's done. If you want to compare yourself and say, I'm a Buddha and put yourself up there with him, that means you went through that six year journey to self awaken. You've taught 45 years in order to share these teachings with all of humanity, right? You left your family, you did all this hard work, you begged for food for 45 years, all the things that the Buddha did, and you're 40 years old or 50 years old or 30 years old or 25 years old and say, You've, you're a Buddha? Are you serious, right? This is like ego and conceit and arrogance. So I think that the more you understand what a true Buddha is, you will agree that you're not a Buddha, but you can attain enlightenment through his teachings, which is going to be certainly wonderful enough. You don't need to be a Buddha because we already have a Buddha. You don't need to be a Buddha. Okay. All right. So any questions on any of this and any of the remaining questions, Max, out there, I am willing to answer. We have a question from Pratik. He says, Gosma Buddha also said that he was not the first Buddha. Gosma Buddha talks about the future Buddha, which is Maitreya Buddha, in his later life. When will Maitreya Buddha come to Earth? <laughs> um, let's take the first part of that question. There are people who say the Buddha talked about Buddhas prior to him. Okay, there's people that talk about that. But what I see in the teachings is the Buddha says that he's the originator, the discoverer, and the declarer of the path to enlightenment. He says that this path that he's teaching is a path that was undeclared before him, that it was undiscovered before him, that he is the originator of the path. So because of that, I'm going to say that there weren't any Buddhas before him, even though this conflicts with what some people say. I'm looking at the teachings and based on what he said and based on what's in the Pali Canon, he's saying that he's the discoverer, declarer, originator of the path unarisen before. And he says very clearly, this path hasn't been taught before him. Okay, so that's the first part is I don't agree that there were Buddhas before him. I, I believe that actually, yeah, I believe that he was the first Buddha. Okay, I have no way of proving that other than his own words in the Pali Canon, which I think are probably strong enough. Um, but honestly, it doesn't really matter. What really matters is that you attain enlightenment during your life, okay? That you learn the teachings and apply them. How many Buddhas there were in the past honestly doesn't really matter, okay? You're right. He did say that there is going to be another Buddha. And he said that was going to occur 2,500 years after his death. He died in 483 BCE. That means Maitreya Buddha, Maitreya means loving kindness or metta, was scheduled to appear in 2017. That was three years ago. For a Buddha to arise in the world, they're going to be self-awakened. They're going to awaken at their own, with their own effort. Once they awaken, they know they're awakened. And there's going to be people around them that know that they're awakened. And a Buddha will typically perform a miracle at the beginning to prove to us a limited number of people that they are awakened. That's what the Buddha did too, Gautama Buddha. So Maitreya Buddha, 
having appeared in 2017, which was three years ago, would have performed a miracle for a limited number of people. But then he would need to go start teaching and he would need to go start sharing his teachings with other people to awaken and help other people become enlightened. That needs to be done by itself and those people who he's teaching aren't necessarily the ones who observe the miracle. Because if you remember, Gautama Buddha only performed a miracle for five people. And then after that, he just started teaching. And other people could see the truth for themselves that their mind was awakening from the teachings that he shared. He didn't keep, he didn't keep performing miracles because he didn't need to. A Buddha doesn't need to keep performing miracles because people can see the truth in their teachings by themselves. So we shouldn't expect that there's going to be a big announcement in 2017 that the Buddha has arrived because the Buddha has to teach a lot of people in order for those people to then become enlightened and see that the Buddha is truly the Buddha. And also remember, a Buddha isn't interested in fame. They're not interested in fortune. They're not interested in notoriety. In fact, a Buddha can actually be more effective if people don't even know he's a Buddha. Because if everybody knew he was a Buddha, then people are going to be coming, bowing down, respecting him, and putting on their best behavior for the Buddha. Because people know he's a Buddha. Well, one of the assets of a Buddha is a Buddha can see the mind of other individuals. They can understand the mind of other individuals through their intention, speech, and actions, through their practice. But if everybody's going around the new Buddha on their best behavior, that power and that strength of him being able to observe people's minds and then helping them to improve the condition of their mind, he's essentially lost that ability because now the whole world knows he's a Buddha. So any Buddha coming into this world today, i.e. 2017, is most likely going to perform miracle for a limited amount of people. And then they're going to start teaching and helping people awaken. And they're not even going to be interested in other people knowing that he's a Buddha. Because not only is he not interested in fame, fortune, or notoriety, he's not interested in people worshiping him. He has no interest in people worshiping him. His only interest is to share the teachings that he knows are going to awaken the mind 100% of all of humanity. That's the Buddha's only goal, is to share the teachings that he knows is going to help awaken the mind of countless individuals during his life and after his death. And allowing countless people to know he's an actual Buddha actually inhibits him in performing that role and that function because now people are going to come around this Buddha and just be on their best behavior. Okay? That's not what a Buddha is interested in. A Buddha is interested in creating as many enlightened people as possible and laying down teachings that are very clear, very concise, so those people can then share those teachings during his life and long after he dies. That's what a real Buddha does. So Maitreya Buddha arrived in 2017. And if you learn and practice the teachings with a true Buddha, you will see the progress of your mind continuing to improve and you will see the condition of your mind improve. And as you learn more and more about what enlightenment is, you will be able to identify other people who are enlightened. And once you become more and more enlightened, not only will you be able to identify who else is enlightened, but if you know enough about how to identify a Buddha, you may even be able to identify Maitreya Buddha. But first and most importantly is for you to learn and practice the teachings so that you can become enlightened. The more enlightened you become, the more you'll be able to observe other people who are enlightened. And like I said, you may even be able to identify Maitreya Buddha as well. Okay, let's go to Judith next. How can we talk about 
traditional Thai medicine as a branch of Buddhist medicine. And then some practices are magic incantation, toxin, spirit medicine, massage with fire for exorcism, and so on. How should we see these practices? Is the focus on healing in order to be able to cultivate a spiritual path? So I used to, you may know, Judith, that I used to be in the Thai massage, Thai medicine community, and I did a lot of work in that community, I published some books, used to have a school, had lots, of, lots and lots of students. And what I observed is the work in that field mainly addresses the physical problems in the body. And as you say, there's some aspects of these teachings of these healing traditions that go into kind of the spirit world and other things as well. But what I noticed in working in that field is it's really about the body, the energy or loam, as well as uh, the mind as well. But predominantly, you're working on that energetic and physical level. And although through the practice of healing arts, you can heal the physical body as a Thai massage practitioner or as a Yam Kang practitioner or a Tok Zen practitioner, there's things you can do to the physical body and the energetic body to heal that. If the person hasn't healed the mind, then all of those things come back. So that's one of the reasons why I transitioned out of the Thai healing arts community into what I'm doing now is because all the ailments of what was going on on the physical energetic body kept coming back because clients weren't addressing the the mental the mind so those type of healing arts have a real important important purpose and they do help people but it's an entire approach there needs to be a, uh, addressed physically the body needs to be addressed physically it needs to be addressed energetically but it also needs to be addressed mentally in in the mind as well. The Buddhist teachings to me are the ultimate solution because if you heal the mind, if each individual practitioner learns and practices teachings to heal the mind, eliminate craving, anger, and ignorance, the self and this ego to attain enlightenment, you will be able to take care of all the others as well. But all of this superstition and spirit magic and incarnation and all of this stuff, it's not part of what is going to ultimately heal the mind, the energetic self, and the physical body. Even though that's been kind of integrated and taught into these traditional uh, disciplines, it's not part of what's going to heal the mind. In fact, all that superstition is only going to degrade the mind and promote more and more wrong view. So if you really want to become a very best healing arts practitioner, you would learn and practice the teachings to attain enlightenment. And as you're working with clients for the various physical or energetic ailments, you could also encourage them to learn these teachings and practice them to heal their mind as well. And then you've got a complete solution of the entire being being healed on a physical level, energetic level, in the mind as well. We have a question from Manal. Is there such a thing as higher or lower vibrational energy? It is sometimes noted there are those past and present who have achieved higher awareness, saints, etc., and have exuded an indescribable peaceful energy. Can you share your understanding of this? The way that I understand enlightenment isn't through vibrational energy. People might describe being around an enlightened being that way, right? Like the pictures that I use show the artwork depicts Gautama Buddha with this aura around his head. But of course, during his life, he didn't actually have that aura, but certain people could see it, right? So. People might describe enlightened beings with this peaceful aura or this peaceful vibration, and that's fine, but I don't really describe it that way, although there's definitely that sense when you're around people who are enlightened, you feel a certain calmness, a certain peacefulness, but it's not necessarily coming from any energetic force or any vibration. 
It's just because that person's mind, the enlightened being, is so peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy. When you're around them, that's what exudes out of them. Just like when you're around a very stressful, hostile, aggressive person, you feel that in their words and their actions and their movements, right? Their intentions, speech, and actions are very hostile, very aggressive, very harsh. And you can kind of like feel that, like, oh, I don't like this. I don't, I don't want to be around this. So when you're around an enlightened being, you're going to feel the peacefulness, the calmness, the serenity, the contentness and the joy that they have in the mind you're going to feel that when you're around them and people you're going to hear people say things like wow i just feel so calm around you or when you're around everything just feels so calm Um, and it's not necessarily a real vibrational energy it's just the feeling in the sense of being around a mind or a consciousness that is peaceful calm serene and content with joy as a follow-up, David, so is it then really how their intentions manifest as speech and action, maybe even in a subtle, unconscious way, yes. not necessarily that they're giving out energy or thoughts? Right. So like if my movements and my gestures were very harsh and very aggressive, you would feel that even through the Internet, even through social media, you would feel that. Or if my words were very aggressive or very harsh or, or very hostile, even through the Internet, you would feel that. And someone might say that's vibrational energy or something like that. But what it really is is just this consciousness interacting with your consciousness. And we're using the physical body in order to create that. So right now, this consciousness, what's in this mind is coming through the voice, through the speech, and through the actions. So you're getting a certain sense of interacting with this consciousness, and you're interpreting that through your own consciousness. So if someone's peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy, you're going to see that through their speech and their actions. Where if somebody has got ill will, or hatred, or aggression, or hostility in the mind, You're going to feel that through their speech and through their actions. This is one of the ways that the more enlightened you become, you can actually observe other people who are not on the path or who are more enlightened or who aren't. Not that you need to judge them or um, compare yourself to them, but this is how you can learn to observe enlightened beings is through the speech and actions. That tells you a lot about whether someone's enlightened or not. Okay, thanks, David. We have a question from Fakir. He says, thanks for this discussion. I'm a Sufi Muslim from Bangladesh. Whatever religion we belong to, we should only need to find the truth. If there is no self, which we can see if we observe deeply, what is going to rebirth? Why don't we see rebirth as we see non-self? Okay, so topic of the cycle of rebirth that we talk about as the cycle of rebirth, I feel the better language to use is the cycle of new existence, okay? Because if we say the cycle of rebirth, the assumption is something is being reborn. In reality, there is really nothing that's being reborn. What's happening is you have multiple lives that are individual existences that are new, unique consciousness in new, unique bodies, for example, different animal bodies, different human bodies in different consciousness. Think about the consciousness like a cardboard box. So we have cardboard box A and we have cardboard box B. These are two completely different cardboard boxes. These are the mind. When somebody dies, if there's craving that still exists in cardboard box A, that craving is the fuel that leads to the next new existence. And that craving moves forward into the new box. So that craving and some of the residual memories from that old existence moves over into this new box. 
but it's a new box. We didn't use anything from that old box to create this new box. The new box is a new box. It's just moving the craving and some residual memories into this new box. But this new box is a new existence of this box. So it's really the cycle of new existence. It's not the cycle of rebirth because there's nothing being reborn. Because as you know, there is no self. So there's no permanent everlasting self that's moving from existence to existence. The only thing that's moving is the craving and some residual memories. That's what ends up in this new box. And it's a new existence, the cycle of new existence. Thank you, David. We have no more questions at this time. Okay. This has been a very interesting discussion with lots of questions. I didn't expect that it was going to go for almost three hours now, but that's fine that it did. I'm pleased to talk with you guys and share these teachings as much or as little as you like. I'm really pleased that you guys seem to have gotten a lot of value out of today's discussion. I would encourage you to dive into the book and really read more of what I actually wrote about each of these misunderstandings and even listen back to this talk again so that you hear it again. Because what I'm doing for you in this entire book and in all the teachings and podcasts and videos and group learning program, all the retreats and everything that I teach is illuminating this path for you as clearly as possible so that the more clear you see this path, then you can walk the path practice the teachings and you can get the results of an enlightened mind. And in order to do that, here at the end of the book, the last chapter, I needed to share with you some of the misunderstandings. And that helps to illuminate the path even more brightly so that you can understand this path more closely. So it's important for you because if you go into various communities, it's important that you're going to see different things that people are teaching that aren't necessarily part of Gautama Buddha's original teachings. And it's important that you understand that those things aren't original as part of Gautama Buddha's teachings. But it's also important that you don't judge people, that you don't have ego and you don't feel arrogance about you knowing more of what the true teachings of the Buddha are versus what other people are doing. Because other people are on various stages of the path and there's no reason for us to compare or judge others for not knowing one particular thing or another. But it's important for you as your practice to be able to see this path as clearly as possible. And that's why I made sure I used this chapter at the end of the book to make it very, very clear. Throughout the entire book, I was sharing with you what are the Buddhist teachings. And now here at the end of the book, I'm sharing with you what aren't the Buddhist teachings that you will probably see in the world. So that's what this last chapter is dedicated to. On Wednesday, we're going to be doing some more practice. We're going to be doing chanting. And that's at 9 o'clock Thai time on Wednesday. And then on Sunday, we have our last uh, formal Sunday talk as part of this six-month-long group learning program, which is going to be the frequently asked questions section of the book. So as you progress this week, learning about the misunderstandings of Gautama Buddha's teachings in the group learning program, learn those. But then on Sunday, we're going to be talking about some of the frequently asked questions that I get as a teacher, either privately or in classes, in uh, various ways that students ask me these frequently asked questions that seem to always come up. I'm going to be sharing those on Sunday as kind of like our last big talk. And that's going to be on Sunday at nine o'clock. And then on Wednesday, August 5th, that's going to be kind of like our last official meeting for this particular group learning program that's been six months long. And then we're going to essentially start this whole program again. So if you've just been joining in the last few weeks or the last month or two, that's okay because you can start all over again. We're going to start beginning at chapter one and go all the way back through the entire book. 
And even if you've been studying now for three or four or five months with me in this group learning program, you can go through this all over again because each individual learning experience, you only usually pick up about 10% of what's really being offered. And then the next time you go through, you kind of get like 40%. And then the next time you get kind of like 80% and then the next time like 100%. So it's important to go through the group learning program multiple times because you're going to hear different questions. I'm going to explain things in slightly different ways. You're going to read things and things are going to click and really soak in for you in a different way than they did the first time you went through. So it will be great to finish up this group learning program it's been six months. It's been a lot of work and a lot of effort, but I've enjoyed every single moment of it. And I hope that you guys have been really gaining a lot of benefit from it as well. And then on August 9th, we're going to start all over again. And we're going to start from the beginning so that you can learn a whole lot more. So I appreciate you learning. I appreciate you practicing the teachings of the Buddha. If you've been doing that for any significant amount of time, I'm sure you're already seeing benefits. This practice of the Buddhist teachings leading on the path to enlightenment, it's only going to benefit you, those close to you, and all of humanity. So never give up. Keep learning and keep practicing. Keep training the mind. And I'll see you next time at 9 o'clock Thai time. Sawadee Thank you again for watching. Enjoy your meditation. Look forward to seeing you online and answering any questions that you might have. Thank you so much.